a celebration of the best of virtual sport and esports, a time for the players to showcase their excellence and their passions for sport. To all the players, I say, now is your moment to shine. Always compete in the spirit of excellence, respect and fair play. Because being a true champion is about so much more than just winning. In sport, everyone is equal. What really counts is a big heart and great passion. Dear players, your stage is set. Your time to shine is now. So give it your best and live the new Olympic motto, faster, higher, stronger, together. the players of the Olympic Esports Series 2023. A very good evening to all. I am pleased to be joining everyone virtually today at the opening ceremony of the inaugural Olympic Esports Week. Today marks a historic moment in the world's sporting journey as we raise the curtains to the first ever Olympic eSports Week. This event bears testament to Singapore's unwavering support to the Olympic movement and the universal values of sports that it stands for. So Singapore really did raise the curtain when it came to setting up the first Olympic eSports week. What a way we have begun. Of course, we just saw the cycling here. They're getting ready for Rocket League, one of the exhibition events. But coming up next is archery. We will be leading to that in just a moment. But of course, Rob Hanna, you've accompanied me here for the cycling. Can you put into words what we just saw today? I'm struggling, actually. I know it's our job, but I'm struggling. I, what I can say is there's a fantastic buzz about the place. I walked in this morning. I'm a late rise. I struggled to get going in the morning, but I didn't need more than one coffee. I was in there, and it was action everywhere. Lots of different things happening. I've seen exhibition cricket going on in eSports fashion. We've seen golf just around the corner as well. There's all sorts. I've heard that we're going dancing tonight as well. Oh, I'm not sure about me, but maybe you and Hannah are. Did you, you got a secret there you haven't told me about? Potentially. I know Rob's got some good moves, but I, I have to say, you know, cycling has set the bar high here. And when we see the athletes that have taken part today, Alice Lethbridge, for example, she was told when she was 13 years old, she didn't have what it takes to be a top athlete. I think she's just proved them wrong. Oh, what a way. We love it. That is part of the Olympic spirit, proving people wrong, bringing those values, what we love about sports. So, of course, we've got 15 sports over three days, one down. Also here in this incredible arena, the Suntech Convention Arena, we've also got a free-to-play arena. So if you're around, come along because there's so much eSports here. Have you had a turn on any of the virtual? Not yet, no, but that is my plan for the afternoon. <laughs> have, had a look at the baseball. That looks very interesting. And also the motorsport. That looks a thrilling one. Yeah, I think I'm going to have a turn on the table tennis. I've, I've never <laughs> tried it, so um, it, it could be an interesting one there. Rob Hanna, it has been so great having you here. We, did, we couldn't have written a script for what happened there. Team Fuego, if you were watching, picked up the first place there. It was a team effort. James, one of the, the riders, said he dreamt about it. I think they, 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 they took the script, they ripped it up and rewrote it in their own way. Team Fuego, the winners exceptional performance from all four of the teams they've provided the action it's just been truly tremendous and a real honor here okay well thank you so much for joining us for the coverage of this cycling we are heading over to the archery now stay tuned
Welcome to the beautiful Singapore, the home of the Olympic Esports Week 2023, as we have a look at some awesome shots of the gardens by the bay. My favorite spot in Singapore. Was there the other day enjoying that. That's actually a flower forest. I was taking plenty of photos, sending it back home on social media, because that's what social media is for, to make everyone else jealous, isn't it? And this is the setting of the Olympic Esports Series 2023. I present to you archery. A sport so old, they say it's been around over 20,000 years, but with the modernization of it through tic-tac-bow, we're going to combine archery with the classic game tic-tac-toe. It's strategy meets accuracy, and I'm your host, Claudio Fabiano, here joined on the panel by some people that are actually really, really good at this game. I personally am not, but these guys are. Let me introduce you to my guest, Eugene Yu, known as Abstract in the esports community, and Harry Thomas, known as Lethal in the esports community. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me here. Thank you so much for having us. I'm, I myself, super stoked to be in here. I didn't think I'll be part of this Olympic esports series, but uh, I'm here now <laughs> and I'm ready to slay some games. Um, unbelievable. <laughs> and Harry, I want to talk to you because you did mention to me off camera that if it wasn't for your best friend's wedding, you probably would have qualified for this competition, but it's still pretty good to fly out here as a commentator, right? Yeah, I'll dare you, I'll dare you, but no, nah, <laughs> I don't think I would be. Or I would, I would make it more decent attempt, so to speak, but I'm really happy to be here. It's uh, you know, first of many and I'm looking forward to see how these matches get underway with all these top, top contenders. Can't wait. We're only moments away. Eugene, I want to talk to you as a local esports legend here in Singapore. How proud are you of Singapore to put on an event like this and also the crowd that's coming straight through the turnstiles? It must be an awesome feeling. I mean, absolutely proud of the fact that we do have more of these kind of events, especially since we are bearing the name of Olympics coming into Singapore. This is great, right? This yeah. is something that we have been waiting for for the longest time ever because mm. we know that Singapore is a gr is great for tourism. Yeah. And we have something as big as the Olympics. There's, there's def definitely getting a lot more eyes on the Singapore and there will be more people coming right in. And let's talk about this now. It's time for archery. Harry, let's talk about tic-tac-bow because I gave it a go. I thought I was pretty good and then I realized I was just playing like a beginner level of it. <laughs> uh, for someone who's never played tic-tac-bow before, what are the basic rules of the game? Yeah, let's give you guys a bit of context. So these players will have nine targets to shoot from. Basically, tic-tac-toe where you need to try and get three in a row. Could be vertical, could be horizontal, could be diagonal as you see fit. But you can also take over each other's targets by getting a higher score. All these matches will be a best of three apart from the grand finals, which will be a best of five. Wow, and Eugene, they are using these awesome bows, and I do see that wind is a factor in this game as well. Will all be all players be playing on the same level playing field? They're all using the same bow and it's the same wind conditions? They're all going to be playing in the same arena, or rather they can choose which arena they want to play. Okay. Different arenas from 9 to 11, they have different kind of wind speeds, and the target board um, massively changes. It could come in different patterns. Mm -hmm. While in the meantime, when we are talking about attachments and all these equipments, they are all equipped with the same bow. Right. However, they can change their attachments, okay. and Different attachments have got different buffs to them. For example, for wind speed, you can at attach an arrow so that you can actually bring down the wind speed from uh, probably 11 all the way until 2, okay. thanks to the bow and the attachments. Wow, and Harry, we've seen 10 players now qualify for this final stage. We're going to see two groups of five. Anyone the audience should keep a keen eye on? Ooh, I'll probably say Monty Day currently is the top seed, but during the qualifiers, he didn't drop a single game, not a single game against numerous different top players. And it was a pretty shocking, really, so to speak, considering mm. his level of consistency. LA1, considering he's actually come from uh, being one of the top Halo 2 players in Europe, now coming out of a 15-year hiatus to compete in tic tac Bow. We had to try and get him out of retirement some way, so we managed to get him out this way round. So those are probably two of the names I'll keep a very, very close eye on throughout the entirety of this tournament. Well, they'll be playing in front of a live crowd, which could be a factor in itself. Let's go over now and see a little bit more of the explainer, although you guys did a fantastic job. In case you're still not completely following, here's how tic tac Bow is going to work. It is a simple and entertaining archery game for mobile devices, in which players test their abilities, aim, and strategy. The game challenges two opponents with a virtual arrow and bow. The target is levitating several meters away. You have a minute to get ready, and each shot gives a score from 1 to 10, depending on how close to the center the arrow landed. The winner will be the one who gets three shots in a row. But a player can take a square away from a rival if their shots gets a better score than that of the opponent. 
and we have a look at here what is about to come up. 24 matches for you guys to sink your teeth into. Two groups in the round robin phase with five players in each before we will have our final four in the semi-finals. A third place match and it'll all end up with the final. Let's be real, all these players are fantastic but everyone wants to be the winner. That's why we're all here gentlemen and Harry it's a really interesting group because out of the 10 players we do have online qualifiers local qualifiers and some Olympic archers joining us as well how good is that I know that's actually incredible the fact that we've got Olympic archers competing in an esports environment we'll have to see if they can really show us how it's done and yeah. for some of the players they may be very experienced in terms of how the game is but the Olympic archers they've got the experience in the background in terms of being at this competitive level on the stage yeah. so also for some of these top players that may have competed in other games in the past so again the experience there could be quite vital for them in that esports environment it's going to be extremely tough it does depend on the olympic archers how much time they've even invested since the previous two qualifiers but for the local players i have no idea what is going to happen yeah. no clue in terms of the information we'll have required so we could be seeing some dark horses in these groups yeah well, we're just moments away from meeting all of them let's meet two of them nice and early who are out and about enjoying what singapore has to offer Hi, I'm Jared Montgomery and I'm from the United States. Hi, I'm Shane Sank and I'm also from the United States. And we are very excited to be here in Singapore to compete in the first ever Olympic Esports Series 2023 archery competition. And today we're actually at one of Singapore's most famous tourist attractions, Gardens by the Bay. Yeah, I heard they have a cloud forest and even a fully air conditioned garden. I think it's gonna be really cool to see. I've never seen something like this before. Yeah, let's go check it out. It began like beginning of March when the Olympics announced the eSports series and it was brand new and nobody was good at it yet so I thought I could do that. I got my first handheld device and I instantly knew that I would be good. Started playing it a lot and just got to the top of the leaderboard and stayed that way for a good while and then made it to the qualifiers and made it through. Started playing it, became the best, I just kind of steamrolled everybody and made my way here. Do your best dinosaur impression. I'm extinct, I can't do that. <laughs> we had a bit of a group chat with some of the better players, and I knew Monty would be a kind of a good punching bag to practice against, so I hit him up, I was like, hey, you wanna run some games? And it just kind of went from there. I think it's really cool how precise the game is. There's a lot of games that's more reaction time-based and, you know, strategy. This one has some strategy, but it's really just how precise you are on the phone, and that, that takes it to a whole different level. I think the most challenging part is probably not shooting bad shots. A lot of the game is, you know, decided by whoever shoots the worst shot first. We all have a pretty similar strategy going into it, but if somebody messes up, then that's probably game over. So nerves play a lot into it. Yeah, I was gonna say the worst for me is just nerves. You just kind of have to be able to control that, and if you can't, your entire game can just disappear like that if you shoot a bad score, so. Oh, jeez. We know we're two of the best players, so we figure if we practice against each other, we're going to get better, so we just play a lot. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. I think a lot of people who played in this competition, it was honestly their first intro into eSports, and I think really anybody could have done it, so. Obviously, I want to win gold, but we're just going to go out there and see what happens. My goal is to take home the gold. Well, everyone's goal is to win it all, isn't it, Eugene? What would you say to these players as some final words about playing in front of a live crowd? Don't be nervous. Just play your best game and don't miss a single shot, especially since that's what Monty Day said. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Harry? I want to ask you one last question. I've been dying to know. If you two were to play tic-tac-boe right now, who would win? I'll let him answer it, but if he gives it the wrong answer, I'll step in. Who would win, Eugene? That'll be him. Right, I don't have to step in then, so I just had to double check first. <laughs> just the cheeky flex there from yeah. Harry. I absolutely love it. Thanks so much, guys. You will be our expert commentators for everyone watching at home. And from myself, it's time for Tic Tac Bo, and we're going to Tic Tac Go to the Tic Tac Show. So I won't leave you with any more terrible raps there. I'm going to Tic Tac Bow out of this one <laughs> and leave you with your expert commentators, the awesome crowd that's flooding the gates here at Suntech in Singapore, and enjoy archery at the Olympic Esports Series. See you soon.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2023 Olympic Esports Series for Archery. And the game that we're going to be looking at today is Tic Tac Bow. A big game that we are going to be watching out for the entirety of the next two hours. Myself, Abstract, as well as Lethal, the both of us are going to be your commentator. And we've got quite a short day, but it's going to be compressed, it's going to be charged up, and I'm pretty sure that we're going to have great days, don't we? We certainly were. Every single match is going to go to the wire. It's very few is going to be causing any issue. And the interesting thing is, the majority of these players are, do have an FPS background in some way. If it's oh. arena shooters, battle royales, or even tactical shooters, as we're mm -hmm. just looking at the format now, and just name them a few names here. Monty Day won the last qualifier, the main qualifier to come in this competition. And he's been practicing, he's been looking really strong so far, averaging 105, 106 seven consistently across the board here. but this is going to be one tough group to get out of here. So honestly, just right off the bat, I do definitely remember a couple of these names, but when it comes down to the second group, this is definitely a tough game, right? The one thing that it really uh, stands out to me is LA1. Watching at the uh, at his qualifiers game, he has a lot more of a different playstyle as compared to everyone else. He has a very aggressive playstyle. Everyone has a very standard gameplay of just shooting their shots, trying to get the amounts and the numbers, while he just decides to go absolutely ham. So honestly, I'm super stoked as to what is about to happen. We have five seconds left onto the stage, and we are going to be grabbing our players out now. Give it up for our players! From United States of America, David Chen! From Singapore, Aiden Wong! From Denmark, Tore Bjorn Norsen. From Japan, Kyotsuki Takebayashi. From United States of America, Shane Sang. From Great Britain, Mark Thurston. From United States of America, Jared Montgomery. From the Netherlands, Yuri D. Bua. From Japan, Kazuya Kamisue. And from Singapore, JS Yao. Finalists, get into position.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start off with the group stage round number one. We, of course, looking at the group stage, I think that there is a lot of things that we should be looking out for previously. Of course, Harry, you were talking about, you know, rotations, we're talking about different kind of strategies, because I myself, I, all I'm trying to do is trying to shoot the target boards, but you have a completely different way of looking at tic-tac-boe. Yes, so during the qualifiers, we've had some community tournaments as well. So everyone knows each other's tendencies in terms of what rotations they prefer. And they obviously everyone had their secondary and third rotations as well. But a lot of people will purposely waste time so they can avoid it, which means it forces your opponent to have to take a target on a certain rotation, which is going to be a lot worse for them and not as favorable. So there's a lot of little bits and pieces here and there which can definitely add up and be the perfect jigsaw puzzle for them to try and uh, claim victory if they can. And we're going to see quite a lot of that for the entirety or the course of this matchup here. But not only that, though, they're obviously going to watch each other's matches as well, just to try and establish a little bit of control mm -hmm. in terms of how they're going to perform in this environment. Because it's like I said before, some of these players are ex-professionals, some of them mm -hmm. are just coming into it for the first time. But saying that, though, for a first-time experience on this stage, some of these players seem very, very confident, especially with their lineups. So honestly, when it comes down to working down to the group stage, are they going to be, what do you think? Do you think that they're going to be like, kind of showing the aces in their sleeves right away, showing these kind of rotations, throwing the, uh, the opponents completely right off the bat, or are they going to be saving it? It depends on who they're playing against. I think if they know they can defeat them in quite a comfortable manner, then I'd probably hide up my sleeve straight away. But the problem is, you've got two groups of five. You have to come top two to even be able to make it into the final four to go right. into that single elimination. If it was like top three or top four in this group, then yeah, I would save everything mm -hmm. to the final moments. But because it's top two, you need to try and get out of the way now before you may make a mishap or you could create a tiebreaker situation by accident. Because of course, you need to go at least four or no or three and in order to qualify, of course, you could go two and two as well, depending on uh -huh. the circumstances of the head-to-head -head percentage and if anyone else has gone two and two as well. But you do not want to put yourself in that situation. You need to absolutely mm -hmm. avoid that like the plague. So I'm pretty sure against some of these local talent as well from Singapore, we don't really have a huge amount of information from them. Uh -huh. Yes, we have it on the other eight players, but the other two, absolutely no clue. So this could be seen a diamond in the rough, a dark horse, so to speak, or the complete opposite end of the spectrum. So I'm very curious to see how they're going to evolve during the course of this event. A little bit of a missing pieces of the puzzle, right? We have a very good idea how ma uh, many of these players play. We've seen the qualifiers games. Well, in the meantime, uh, one thing that we are looking out for is um, uh, Makasu, right? Makasu is going to be fighting against, or rather playing against uh, Spring. And Spring has put up quite a bit of a name throughout and worldwide, if I gotta have to say. As someone who's still relatively new to Tic Tac Bow, I already know what this guy is capable of. It's a bit of a worry as well. I was watching out back to see how some of his players were performing, and I was watching Mekasu against Zoo Senpai earlier, uh -huh. and he was just hitting 107s for days like at his day oh. job. It was actually ridiculous what he was averaging wow. across the board. And Spain is probably thinking, I wish he didn't say that, mate, but I'm sorry, <laughs> but that's what I witnessed. That was just the one or two games I witnessed earlier on, but... Mekasu was looking really good, like very, very solid. And I think there's going to be a few shots here and there which he's going to have to risk in order to keep himself in this. But remember, though, Spring uh -huh. has also got a very high level of consistency across That's the board. Right. And with one of his teammates in Monty Day who can establish a lot of strategy and tactical control, there might be a way for him to be able to take down Mekasu here. Consistency. That's what we're looking for, right? When it comes down to that conversation between uh, Spring as well as Monty Day in the short little video, did he talk about the fact that consistency is one of the most important things when it comes down to Tic Tac Bow? Everyone is just waiting for that one moment when that one player screws up. Yeah, and I think with Tic Tac Bow in general, it's whoever makes that first initial bad shot going to cost them the entirety of that round, especially right. if you're going second in this matchup in terms of coin flip. It's going to be a really rough road for them, and they know they're going to have to try and overtake one of their opponents at target, so probably at least a bare minimum, 105 or 107. It's going right. to be extremely difficult task. It's going to be a tall order in itself, but I think a lot of these players will be capable. They've had a good warm-up session early one. They managed to get used to the devices and be able to actually establish a little bit of uh, familiarity to a certain degree. And that's the, one of the players there, Monty Day, one of the 
favourites in this competition, mm -hmm. and one of the highest seeded players here as well, also winning the qualifiers not too long ago. So it's going to be an extremely tough ask for some of his players, but it's like I said before, you've also mentioned a player like LA1 where yep. he's been known 15 years ago as a player who's very good at adapting to a certain situation, and he also learns extremely quickly as well. He's mm -hmm. it's, it's weird style from LA1 where he's very patient with his shots, but the shots he takes, he tries to throw his opponent off to many different levels, and it's uh, a real pain, because I remember 1v1-ing him back a day <laughs> on a previous uh, FPS title, uh -huh. and he can be a real nuisance. I always feel like my aim skill is better, but his strategical factors in so many different ways in terms of how he adapts, I just need to be extremely careful, and uh, hopefully that's some good advice for everyone <laughs> else hearing that <laughs> earlier. But yeah, we will get underway shortly, but yeah, uh, this will be a good indicator to see how these players are going to perform. They need to get out the gate strong because they need that high morale boost to get into that top two. And the fact they've got to get top two in the group of five, it's it's going to be very tough for every single one of these players. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a tiebreaker through uh, one of these groups um, before we head into the single elimination side in the top four. Yep, speaking of adaptability, although we're not watching LA1 play just yet, but I really want to touch, uh, touch on this topic because we had this conversation before. I was telling you about the fact that, you know, look, LA1, he's a very aggressive player. He's a risk taker, and I absolutely love the fact that he's just breaking the norms. While you, on the other hand, said that that's not his typical play style. So is it just his, you know, kind of adaptability coming in based on what he has seen so far in the qualifiers, you think? Yeah, sometimes he's aggressive, sometimes he's not. It depends on the rotations he gets and the right. lineups he has to get as well. So there might be matches where I've witnessed where he's very, very patient because he's getting the rotations he requires. Uh -huh. I mean, you've probably witnessed some matches where he's been very aggressive. That's why yes. we both had completely different takes on the matter because it just depends on what hands his opponent is going to force him on mm -hmm. in terms of what rotation and what arena it's going to be on. So I'm very curious to see how he's going to perform later when he did come second in the competition. He fought all his way through the loser's bracket. He came through the loser's bracket early in the qualifiers and it was just created this fabulous Cinderella story up to the top two, oh, which yeah. is just unreal. With Monty Day, of course he does. How dare you defeating him 3-2 <laughs> in the grand final. That would have been absolute madness if LA1 actually managed to progress all the way through. But some of these Japanese players, man, you know, with uh, Zo Senpai and Mekasu, they're looking much stronger than what we witnessed in these qualifiers. Oh, really? So I think they've had a bit of a grind leading up to this they moment. Did. Yeah, I think, I think so. I think so. I'm looking forward to see what they have got in store for us. Now, I want. Uh, okay, so right before we jump into the game, we know that, you know, when it comes down to the point system, when we are looking at the target board, is all the way from zero, climbing all the way uh, up to 100, and perhaps, if, sorry, even 110. So, putting aside sub 100, what is, consist, uh, con uh, what is considered as a bad shot? Ooh, I would probably say anything below 105, in my opinion. Uh. I think, like, 105 is like a... Okay, you know, like a, uh, you know, it's safe, top that. safe, but not super safe. I would uh -huh. say a safe shot is 107 and 108. That's kind of like the safety net because you, you know that they're gonna have to try and get a frame perfect shot mm -hmm. for that 110, and you have to be quite ballsy in order to go for a shot like that. But some of these players can do, but I don't think they're gonna take that much of such a huge risk. Like when they see 107 or 108, they're probably gonna turn around and go, right, we'll leave that there. That target's yours for the entirety of this game and then you will see what happens in the next one. But I think the only time I would be worried if I saw anything 102 and below. If I see someone hit 102 and below, that's basically my calling card to go, oh, cheers, mate. You know, you just give me a nice large window um, opportunity to dive straight in as we're going to now go straight into our first group match here between Mekasu and Spring and this is going to be a very close affair to begin with. With Spring starting things out, it is of course expected based on you know kind of the strategies that the first player would always want to gun for the center. Now of course you know putting aside the the, the common sense rule whereby you want the center. The center right. is where things are Okay, great start for Spring, but center is where you want to start because it gets you everywhere. 
It certainly does. And to start things off in the center with 109, Great. that's a blinding start here. 103. Oh. You can, can you see what I mean, though, with the point system? Like, 102, 103, they know that it's not a safe enough target oh. to go for. And actually gets a 99 here. So that's going to give Megasu a huge opportunity to get back in this. I absolutely love how we have the player camera. We can actually look at their reactions real time. So Megasu, he was really disappointed with his 103. And I'm pretty sure that he will want to bolster and strengthen that part of the board. Because once Spring takes over that board, I think it's definitely going to start to get a little bit tougher for him. It certainly will. It hits 104. He knows it could have been a little bit better. It's not the safest shot, but after Spring hitting that 99, he knows that he may have another opportunity here, but he gets oh. it just by one point with the 104 here, Eugene. It's not that high. And honestly, Mekasu would want to take that board away because at this point in time, if he leaves these two boards alone, there is going to be a very high chance that Spring can consistently set up traps for him, whereby the next move is, in is inevitable doom. So waiting to see. He's going to pull this off. They're being very patient with his shots. They're Jeez, taking, oh, actually takes nice. it back over 109. What? You couldn't ask for more, and it's now going for the 80 meter targets now. Oh. So, this is going to be a doozy one here for Spring. I did say, though, mate, but he's been mm -hmm. averaging really well earlier on. That's right. I mean, Mekasu definitely did not start off great, right? However, he did manage to come back, and he did manage to get the 109 at the top left hand corner of the board. So, Ma the only thing that Spring can do at this point in time is to block that off. So, right now, Mekasu, the only thing they can do. Respond to it. Go for the top right corner and see what you can do from there. He can't have anything below 105 here. He knows that it could be curtain call for him. Depending on the circumstances. He does he was a little bit debating on terms of whether he wants to go for the bottom left and just close it out here and now. But he only has one opportunity. If he misses and doesn't get that 108 and above. But he knows that Spring's just going to take that straight away. So again, just being very patient. I only got 35 seconds left this early on. But Ooh, the problem is he only what? gets a 70. He must have misread the wind conditions there or when it actually made that rotation. So now Spring only needs 70 or more in that top rate to secure victory. So it's really unfortunate. He was waiting for the, the target ball rotation to move left. And in the meantime, the wind is also moving left. So the only thing that you gotta have to do is to get your crosshair slightly off to the right because the target board moves slightly faster than two, uh, 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 the wind speed of two. Just slightly faster. Yeah, it certainly does. It's uh, very unfortunate. Mekasu had, uh, I wouldn't say a slow, but it was uh, it wasn't bad. Like 103 to start things off, just to get yourself into it. But the fact that he wrote, retook it with 109 was remarkable. And I was like, Absolutely. oh, okay, the momentum's building now. Morale's looking very, very good. But that 70, I think that only occurred due to the fact that he had it lined up for the previous rotation, but then it rotated straight afterwards. So oh. that's why he got the 70. And I've seen it happen to a lot of players, and it can be very frustrating. But it would not surprise me if he did come back in this match. Remember, guys. It is a best of three. All matches are going to be a best of three apart from the grand final, which is a best of five. But I assume we will see a lot more from Mekasu here. Just uh, I don't think it was more based on lineups of those 80 meter targets. I think it was just due to the fact that the rotation moved just as he took that shot. It is unfortunate. You can't take too long once the rota uh, your desired rotation comes in, right? The longer that you take, the higher risk there will be. And of course, we're talking about margin, uh, margin of error, right? We are only humans. We are not robots. We gotta have to <laughs> look out for the best way to minimize the margin of, of error, and that is to really recognize the pattern as to when the, your rotation starts. And once that gets started, you might want to release that bow as soon as you can. Yeah, uh, completely understandable. I kind of feel like once the rotation is kind of like 80, 90 percent away from. Uh, then go into a different rotation. That's when I kind of just leave it alone and just be a little bit more patient. But they were being patient enough as it is. They were only mm -hmm. halfway through that game Great. and it was still around the 30 seconds left for Mekasu. So already Spring starting off with 106 here, which is a good start from him. Bang on in into the centre. As he will be going first, but Mekasu 109. That's a lovely stay. way to respond. 
completely cemented that top left-hand corner of the board. And that pretty much right. forces Spring to go for adjacent board. But unfortunately, he only managed to get a 99, which may, I, uh, I believe, may be a little bit enticing for Mekisu to actually take that over. But it really depends on what kind of gameplay he was he's really wanting to go. Does he want to fill up the board with more numbers? Because as the second player, you have the opportunity to have a lead in numbers once all nine boards are occupied. Yeah, Mekisu, rightly so, You've got the 108 in the top middle, perfectly understandable. He could either have gone for the bottom middle and just take the risk of getting that average score and then let Spring take it over, or just take over his for, you know, safety, for extra insurance, so to speak. And that's exactly what he's done. But 109 and 108 is looking fabulous right now as Spring mm -hmm. just making a decision on what to do next. Of course, he can go for one of those two targets, but... Getting 110 or 109, one of those frame-perfect shots. I can't really see this happening. He needs to go for that top right to That's then right. force Megasu onto the bottom left. You've got to have to play it a little bit safer. I mean, generally, Spring didn't manage to get the first round win. So right. you do have a little bit of a space to play around with, a little bit of a wiggle room. But uh, regardless, you wouldn't want to throw away any lead that you have to kind of bring the game back into a best of one. The 105 points that Spring managed to get at the top right hand is going to be challenged by Mekasu instead of kind of blocking the bottom left side of the board and he actually misses by a single point. I can't believe it. I was. Oh. It was very risky, but you know what? When it's 105, it's not always super safe. Spring's going to finish with, with that 99 in the bottom left and will take this series 2 But you know what? I respect that because I did say before he's been averaging 107 quite a lot in the back room, but... This time round, it just wasn't going to happen. You could see it was a favourable target, which he's probably practised time and time again, but we will definitely see a lot more from him later on. Probably will see a lot more. Now, with the first game done and dusted, we've got Spring that will be leading the board until we have the tally scores from every single one of these players in the first round. So don't, uh, don't forget, we have Group A, we have Group B. So... There will be two players that will be advancing from Group A, and like uh, similarly, two players that moves up from the Group B. Yeah, so of course, with these top two players from each group going through to make it into the top four, and of course, after that will be single elimination where the challenge will continue. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to find out shortly here. And for Mekasu, you could see that he was a little bit frustrated. He had, to, he had such a good start. That's he the had. worst thing. But the problem is, when what you're in that mean? situation and you've got the advantage, you get the choice in the matter, don't get me wrong, in terms of having to overtake that target or not. He could have mm. gone for the bottom left, but he, he didn't want to give the opportunity away. That was the issue. Like He wanted to take advantage of it here and now to tie things up, which is, this is what I said before, I completely respect that. He's probably thinking to himself, he, ha he takes those shots for days and always gets 105 plus without an issue. And you can see it in his face that it was just a risk which he just had to take because if he did block the bottom left hand side from Spring, there's a good chance that Spring would have tried to make that first attempt to overtake that anyway as we've got the leaderboard now just to see exactly how things have been going so far with D-Chan and Spring winning their matches, so to speak, and LA1 and Yuri also first in Group B. So looking pretty promising so far, I think that the... Uh Whoever that have won is not too surprising. We have seen the power and the prowess of Dijan, Spring, LA1, and Yuri. So them leading the charts is definitely not something that is unheard of. However, going down to anyone else, that's going to be the question. The thing is, in Group A, Monty Day have yet to uh, have yet to play. So looking at Dijan, Spring, and Monty Day, the three of them is going to be my top three in Group A. But unfortunately, one of them will have to bow out. I know, it's, uh, it's a real shame. We want to see all of these guys play for 12 yeah. hours throughout the entirety of this <laughs> tournament. But yeah, we have to kick one out or three out in three each of these groups, yeah. so to speak. So yeah, it's going to be uh, very interesting to witness how they perform on stage later on. But Mekasu doesn't need to worry too much. I still feel like he could easily come back in this competition. Spring is probably one of the favorites to come out of that group. Uh -huh. It's a shame he has lost against him, but Whoever else is going to be next, he needs to defeat them. If he doesn't, then there's going to be some issues. If he does, he could potentially force a 2-2 two two tiebreaker, which 
would not surprise me at all in the slightest. And of course, if that does happen, we'll probably be sitting here waiting for the admins to confirm who will go through. And it's uh, going to be a close one, I'm sure, as we're now going to find out our next matchup very soon. And I think it is a nice way to start things off here, to get some of the top dogs in our first match straight away. And you can see there's a little bit of nerves, a couple of 99s <laughs> here and there. But it's just one of those things. D-Chan just showing off a little bit there. But we're going to see D-Chan versus Monty. Ooh. And we've talked a lot about Monty earlier on. Pretty much an Android at this game with some of the lineups and some of the things he can do here but Dean Chan is no walkover no slash at all in the slightest day Eugene they are both no strangers to all the players in Tic Tac Bow in fact they are not strangers to everyone here on the value you gotta have to expect big games coming from these two so far when it comes down to game number one we haven't yet seen a full nine bot take we haven't seen a lot of aggressive takeovers per se. Round one, yes. There were a couple of takeovers until the point where the board actually went over to 80 meters. But I'm pretty sure Monty Day versus D-Chan, we have two very similar gameplay, uh, game styles, I gotta have to say. D-Chan himself is a very passive player. And naturally, from what I remember, even if there is a 103 on the board before in the qualifiers, he don't necessarily challenge it. He's a very safe player. He just wants to fill up the board and then eventually take the chance and take the time to really evaluate out of all these nine boards, which one is the most vulnerable one. Mm. Yeah, I could totally agree as well. And you can see on stage, if you want to know what the paper is on their desk as well, it's just reminders of their lineups they've created themselves. If it was me and I was on stage, I'll be having my 80 meter lineups straight away, just in preparation, <laughs> because I know for well extra insurance due to the pressure of the situation, <laughs> exactly as we're going to be jumping straight on in, as it looks like Monty will be first to take us in this match. Of course, everyone's played a match apart from two of the players out of both of these groups. This is going to be Monty's first game, and it's going to be against D-Chan who did place third in the qualifiers previously. So let's see how Monty's going to do in this first matchup. It is going to be two kilometers an hour towards Great. the right-hand side, getting the 104, which is a, little a bit decent high. start. Yeah, mm -hmm. not too bad, especially in the center. Now, of course, I do have a question here. How much of a lead do you have, or rather, what kind of advantages do you get being the first place, or, I'm sorry, first shooter or the second one? Great. Being first is massive due to the fact that you can dictate how you want this game to go in terms yeah. of score. Of course, if you get anything below 105, it's going to cause some massive issues, and then your opponent can just force it to a 70, 80 meter target range. And then it's also the same fact that once you take over your target, you just feel like it's uh, going to be a bit of a struggle here. 108 Ooh. straight afterwards in the bottom right. So D Chan does need to either take over the center he has or to. block the top left. Yeah, so, so this has been a common play that we have seen in the qualifiers. As long as you have the center and a single corner, you're essentially locked in a trap. And it's very difficult for you to take over. Now, at least for D-Chan, he, he, he has the chance to think about things. He wants to go for the safer play, whereby he wants to Great. block it off in the, uh, in the top left, and then bat it on onto the next shot that Monty Day sh uh, goes for. Because 104 may not be as comfy as you want it to be. So the next shot that Monty Day shoots is either going to be li literally anywhere in the board. And D-Chan is forced to take over. He can no longer block. He must take over something. Right. Ooh, okay, oh, honestly, 103. That's what he's looking for. But this is it. So D-Chan now can take over that middle right because he has to take over the middle right due mm -hmm. to the fact that there's two opportunities for Monty to take this. 103 isn't safe by all means. He mm -hmm. can easily take this over. Monty must have been so frustrated when he realized D-Chan get that 108. He was, if it was 105 or lower, I think he would have actually risked it and tried and taken that over and got that first game. But D-Chan, Definitely knows good needs to go for this middle right hand side. If he fails, Monty's gonna take this first game. And D Chan's got the rotation he wants. He manages to get it 106. And we're now heading into the 80 meter range. So what is Monty's next priority gonna be? Where is he gonna go next? He could go to the bottom left to force his opponent to have to take over another target, which would be quite frustrating, as he will have to either go middle bottom or Seven the top bottom right afterwards. Good. The center bottom sounds good. Mm. If you're looking at the uh, the bottom left, you are def uh, technically giving right. D-Chan the chance to actually line up at the left side of the board. D-Chan though, what's he gonna do next? What's his game plan gonna be? Monty's not giving him any room 
has set himself up for victory, just forcing D Chan to have to consistently overtake these targets. And we're going to find out shortly. Now, I'm, I'm curious here by Monty Day's play. Instead of going to the bottom center, which sets up for a double opportunity, why would you think that he will go to the top center where there's only a single opportunity? I think he's trying to make it so that he's forcing Dee Chan to not have an absolute room to go in and take oh. an early victory later on. But because of that 102, Monty is going to be taking this no problem at all. Just sees the fire away at the bottom middle and take this first game in the best of three. But Dee Chan, though, put on a very good effort. Monty was forcing his hand every single time and Dee Chan was forced to overtake every single target. As Monty a couple of times Great. did have two opportunities each one. 96, but it doesn't matter. All that matters is it takes that first initial game in this series. That's the end for the first round with Monty Day getting himself the first game in. Dee Chan definitely was very close. He did put himself in a very tough spot, you know, getting, uh, getting his board taken over by Monty Day, but he did not yield all the way until the very end, and it's not necessarily based on the fact that he didn't do well. It's just f truly just based on the fact that he gotta have to make the play. There's no other play that he can go for. True, he can go for the block at the, bot uh, at the bottom side for a relatively safer play, but you are still technically dancing in the palm, uh, the palm of Monty Day. And you may see as well, uh, for the viewers at home, if you want to know why they're so patient or why it takes them quite a while to go in for those shots, it's either two reasons. One, they're waiting for the rotation which they prefer, or two, they know their opponent's preferred rotation and they'd rather delay it enough so it forces them to make a more uncomfortable shot or waste a huge amount of time later on. As we're going to dive straight on in and we're going to see how things are going to great. start things off. 108 bang on into the center target and this is a great way for D-Chan to try and create that reverse sweep in this best of three. So when, it, when we are looking at this great. arena, there is quite a bit of different pants going around. We have seen left to right, right to left, uh, from uh, diagonal from the top right to the bottom left. Now we are looking at the reverse pattern. So it's going literally every single direction and every single rotation that we are looking for. So far, D-Chan seems to prefer a left-right or right-to-left shot hey, instead of going for anything diagonal. Yeah, he seems to like those horizontal rotations quite a bit. You're not wrong there at all. And taking over that top left target is going to cause some serious issues here for Monty. Not too serious, actually. He can take over that 103 in the top left as he sees fit, but he's right. going to play it a little bit safer, gets 105. A little bit safe, depends if D-Chan wants to risk. He can risk this, actually. He doesn't have to worry about losing the next game. He can go for it as he sees fit, but he's got so much time on the clock, he can wait for his preferred rotation. So he's waiting for that diagonal pattern to move into the horizontal side, which he's now planning to do. Bullseye. And look at that, it does beat, Ooh. but he gets a bullseye, he gets 110. And this is going to cause some serious issues here. Now, this is pretty much a guaranteed victory for D-Chan. Monty actually needs to take over the middle left target with another 110. But if he does this, this would be absolutely crazy. He oh. does not. 106, which means D-Chan is going to take the bottom left or the middle right. And he's going to make this one apiece in this best of three. It is unfortunate for Monty Day, but we are now down to the wire. One Great. is to one. And anyone could walk away with this. But d -chan, we gotta have to give it to him. A hundred and ten. Right when he really needed it. Yeah, getting that frame perfect 110 is not easy. To be fair, getting anything over 100 is an easy shape or form. These guys are just so good, they make it look easy. That's the difference here. But getting that first initial 110 in the middle left, he guaranteed that game. That's why he was so relieved afterwards. Because exactly. he was like, right, I've got this now. Unless he gets another 110, which would just have been ridiculous. But he had no choice. He had to. Doesn't matter. He couldn't go for any other targets because no. it would have been a guaranteed loss. Exactly. And the fact that he was being a lot more patient with his rotations as well massively benefited. And, you know, for Monty to be one of the favorites in the competition, it's now one apiece. Anything could go here. So, one is to one. We're down to a best of one game. Both of these players are rating themselves and they are technically teetering on a breaking point. They just need to make good shots all the way for this final round in order to get themselves a little bit more lead, at least for D-Chan. He will be able to get that huge lead of getting two wins, not a single losses just yet. And Monty Day, 
this being his very first game in this Olympic eSports series. This is it. So he's had a little bit of time to kind of adjust himself in terms of getting used to the tournament environment in an offline setting, so to speak. And you can see that's one of the players there, LA1, just looking feisty there, getting into this next game. Of course, all these players are playing their matchups as we speak. And I'm very excited to see what the, not just the verdict, but in terms of predictions, how this is going to unfold between Monty and Dechan here. Just certainly for Monty, getting that 90s point in the top left is just massively, not just cost him, but it was a huge morale boost for Dechan. Just to do the fact that he saw him as quite of an invincible opponent, but now he's like, oh, okay, actually, well, I, could, I could win this one now. Now, okay, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot while we have the time, right? Who Go are on. the two players that you would want to see from these two groups? Uh, in terms of the grand finals, like who I want to see who do you want to see each other? move up to be the top four of this archery matchup? I, I, to be fair, I can see both D Chen and Monty still qualifying because obviously one of us got to beat each other eventually. But I would love to see maybe LA1, Monty, Spring, and maybe Mega Sue or someone to actually Mega make Su. it through because he's very, very good. But his counterpart. So Senpai, you can see there, managed to take what? his game against LA1. Absolutely crazy stuff and a very clean victory as well. Technically, we didn't see the entirety of that Great. match. But I think I have a very good idea what has happened. Because we've seen this happening in the qualifiers yep. game before. LA1, he just went all out in the second round. Despite the opponent having a really good score, you couldn't take over. And you absolutely lost it right off the bat. I think so, Senpai, of course, like I said, we missed the majority of it, but I'm going to assume that he took over two of LA1's targets instantly without messing around and managed to win that. I'm not too sure if he won the series or the game, but we'll uh, double check that later on. But let's get back to this matchup. 109 for Monty in the center, 108 for D Chan in the bottom left. So you can see very, very safe targets for now. Mm -hmm. Both of these players have managed to get themselves very solid picks so far. And Monty Day, generally speaking, Monty Day as well as Dechan, they're right. constantly always wanting to go for the horizontal pickoffs. But I think that when it comes down to this arena, things are definitely going to be a tad bit different. Diagonals and verticals. Even right now, Dechan is actually going for Who's diagonals that? and he's not taking any time off at all. Okay, Monty's definitely not be going for that one, that's for sure. So what's his strategy going to be next? He's getting the rotation he requires. Can go for that right. bottom middle and gets 106. So the consistency in terms of averages now for both his players rising very high. Averaging roughly 107, 108 across the board. And D-Chan having his second bullseye. Helping Matt. But you can see that he can either try and block the top middle or go for the bottom middle and overtake that target to help himself or give him a little bit of leeway in his matchup here. Because you've got to remember, this is only round three of nine and time is ticking. He's only got a minute left, of course. If you are new to watching Tic Tac Bo, they do start with two minutes and they have nine rounds. It doesn't normally get Great. to the nine rounds, but he will get 104. Ooh. And Monty, he can go for this risk. He, he will can. not be a, a unsecure shot, indeed. Yeah, there's no opportunities from the side of D-Chan at Take this off. point in time. So unfortunately, D-Chan took it. There's no risk in taking that shot. There was no opportunities at all. Even if he did not manage to take over, D-Chan still could not win the game by the next round. So it made absolute sense. Monty Day went for it and he managed to get it. His very first game against, uh, his very first game in the group stage against D-Chan results with him with a win. Certainly does. It was a close affair, so to speak. Very I was close. on the edge of my seat with that one because I had absolutely no idea. If, if D-Chan took that, then it, that would have thrown a massive spanner in the works for that group because I think Monty may, may have actually beaten the next opponent and I think there would have been some kind of tiebreaker situation. But Monty created normality into the groups once again and that was his first match, so we'll be seeing him in that second place spot. But Spring continuing plowing Ooh. through Group A as well, currently going two for zero. But on the other side, we've got Yuri and Zhu Zenpai still looking pretty at the top of the leaderboard, just waiting for their next match as LA1 and Jin sitting just behind them in third place. So things are definitely starting to spice up a little bit, especially in Group A. 
Spring 2-0, Monty Day 1-0. I mean, Monty Day only had a single game played, as well as Makasu. So we we got we, the. The whole event is definitely going to start ramping up. We'll get a better idea as to how the entire game is going to be like. But remember, we will have a total of five games from the group stage, and that will be aired. And by the end of the five games, we will then have got the finalist. And honestly, even though we're only two rounds in, or rather, we're coming into the third round, I'm already excited. I, I'm super stoked to find out who is going to be the finalist. The players have shown themselves in great light. And especially when we're talking about statistics, for Dichan, two bullseye right on the nail, 110. So technically speaking, in the final round of uh, group stage round two, his average score is technically speaking 108, since he's got a 108, 110, and a 104. Yeah, that match overall was literally a 107, 108 average from if you combine all of them. It was actually ridiculous how much of a high-scoring game that was. And the fact that we get to watch Zo Zenpai versus Yuri, this is just going to be a matchup of mammoth proportions indeed. Zo Zenpai, he's been averaging 108 earlier in the back room consistently, no matter what target it was. And I remember he was actually on his other phone whilst doing that at the same time. And I was like, my God, this he is a man of many talents and jack of all trades. As Yuri here, you know, a very young player. And one thing with Yuri as well, it could go one of two ways. I did say that if he gets through the groups, then he can continue on forward as potentially one of the favorites. He can get a little bit nervous at times, but now Whoa. that he's got that first matchup out the way and he's looking very good and in prime position to continue forward, then we can expect nothing less from him now. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time for some of these players to get out the gate strong, but now for Zou Senpai just taking on LA1 and defeating him, and Yuri, of course, win, win his first matchup, we're going to have to see exactly who's going to be the clear indicator after the first game in the series. I think it's relatively fair to say that they have got their warm-up done. Yeah. They, want, they they are probably just going to go all out from this point in time. No more mucking about now here, Eugene. <laughs> 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 so honestly, Zhu Senpai is, is on a momentum, right? Beating LA1. I think that that is a very big hit to LA1. And on the other hand, it's going to be a great momentum shift for LA, uh, for uh, Zhu Senpai. Whatever they don't want to play from this point onwards, they have got their game plan on. Do you have any information as to what kind of rotation Zhu Senpai as well as Yuri usually go for? I don't have a preferred rotation in terms of what they're going for, but I think after what this first game, we should get a clear idea because you can tell by the length of time it takes to certain areas and certain shots, but Zo Senpai is going to be looking pretty damn good considering he just took down earlier one. And if Yuri also takes down earlier one, then we could be seeing these two players going into the next stage of this tournament. But if earlier one takes down Yuri later, then it could mean we may witness a tiebreaker, but we'll keep you guys updated at that stage here, but we've got Great. two kilometers going towards the west side, 106 for Zhu Zenpai. A great start from him in the center, and we're going to see how Yuri is going to respond. Great. He's going to respond with 109. Ooh. Lovely stuff. Very consistent coming in from both of these lads. 106 and 109. Zhu Zenpai pretty much going to have to play the adjacent tile from where Yuri has got his shot down. I don't think that we'll be expecting too much of an aggressive play coming in from either one of these players. And all we can do is just watch and wait to the point where Yuri decides to break the mold and decides to right. end the calm before the storm. 105, not too shabby, but also not the safest. You could see Zo Zenpai was a bit uh, umming and ahhing about it, but it's good enough to maybe keep Yuri away, but he's actually looking Ooh. quite tempted to go for the shots. He's gonna go for the overtake, he Ooh. does, and he gets 101. A little bit unfortunate there, but that does mean Zo Senpai could guarantee his first game win in this first series right. here. Lovely stuff from him and a good way to close it out. But this is what I'm talking about here. But this That's a high level of consistency from uh -huh. him. The fact that he's getting angry, well, not angry, but a little bit frustrated with 105. 105 ain't too shabby. It's not sa super safe, but right. it's enough to maybe keep him away. So honestly, I, I will say that yeah, Yuri, a little bit of that shivers going along, uh, going around there, right? 101 when you are 
you know, facing off against an opponent that has 105, I think that that is not necessarily a very difficult shot to make. But I think that is all these pressure that's come to him and knowing that he's on a big stage, he's, he's fighting for his country and he's just trying to do his absolute best. So whatever that he has got right now, it will tally up and move on to the next game. So there's a very high chance that Yuri wants to stay here. He wants to stay in the competition and thus play a safer route for this round. I love this as Zo Senpai was just staring at him. Did you see? Like yeah. he was raw, just go right, come on, mate, take your shot. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Literally it's incredible. Great. 108. This is a great start here from Yuri. And Zo Senpai, you know, when he was just looking at him, just Playing the mental game here, I like it. As he's going for the top left now, looking to go east Ray. two kilometers, Ooh. but he responds with 108 himself, and he's going your move, mate. Zeus Empire is really putting up quite an aura over here. If Yuri even knows what's going on to his other side, just all he need to do is turn his head, and I think that that will be the mental game between Zeus Empire and Ray. Yuri. Oh, look at this, 108 oh, that's again, isn't it? Yeah, that's back beautiful. and forth. And he can't take the risk to take that over or to try and get a frame-perfect shot with a 109 or 10. But rightly so, Wait. Yuri is going to go for the middle right. 103! Oh. That's going to be a window of opportunity here for Yuri to take this middle right spot. He tried to take 105 earlier, so I'm sure he's going to try and go for this one anyway. Even if he fails, he's still got another opportunity later. So he's going to try and grab this if he can, making it to go to the horizontal side on the right. Gets it! Manages to go. take over 107. 208 and 107. Again, can't complain there. Looking much, much better from what we saw compared to that first game. Definitely a lot better. 108 and 108. Unfortunately for Zeus Senpai, he's the one that made the shot that did not quite work out for him, right? So, ultimately, we've got Yuri climbing himself back on track. But, you know, I th still think that the mental game is still very evident here. Yuri, you know, all these small little body language means a lot. Yuri has always shifted his gaze away from Zeus Empire, if you realize. He would never really just look at Zeus Empire while Zeus Empire is just standing up tall, just staring right at him. <laughs> well, just to give you a little bit of history as well with, um, with Zeus Empire, he's actually in challenge challenges in the league scene for 10 years. Ten. So he is no stranger to any kind of competitive competition. Not too sure in terms of a stage or in tournament environment, but he seems very calm, cool, and collected and exactly. doesn't really seem to be phased by the crowd, the environment itself, anything like that. He seems pretty chill, but maybe too chill considering what we just witnessed there with Yuri just smashing out with those 208s and 107. So he needs to be on his toes here. And this coin flip for like this game number three is going to be super crucial because if you do have to go second, it's just a game of not having any opportunities, having to take over my opponent's target each and every single time. You don't want to be on that spot because at some stage, if they do keep hitting these 107s and above on average, it's going to get even harder and harder than you may at some point have to go for that frame perfect shot of 109 or 10. And that's when it could be the curtain call for that person going second and losing out on the series. As we are about to move on to game number three of this round, we are going to be looking at Yuri that starts this first. And so far, the player that starts first is the one that has been winning statistically. So, just right off the bat, I think that we do have that ties that kind of shifted towards Yuri just by a tad, tad little bit. Unless we're looking at a bad shot from either one of them. Yeah, he's getting ready for his horizontal rotation. That's good. Right? Yeah, to get it, gets 107. People are probably thinking why you is shaking his head a little bit. Sometimes those horizontal targets can be a little bit easy for you to grab because of course with the winds going two kilometers to the west, you just need to aim it just a tiny bit 
onto the left hand side into the middle to mm -hmm. guarantee that 109 110. But because he only got a 107, Great. shouldn't really affect him later on, hopefully. But Su Senpai responds with 108 in the top left. This is like a game of chess. When you are on a timer, in the initial start of the timer, you can take your time. You can take your time and slowly play the game. But once you are starting to lose out on the time, you can no longer really play on these rotations. So even if you are really good on these specific rotations, be it the horizontal, diagonals, or vertical ones, you still gotta have to practice yourself and practice Great. more on the other rotations. In the very event that you are running out of time, you gotta have to make a shot no matter what. So Yuri leaves a small opening there with 105 on the middle left. So Zenpai though, what decision is he going to make? Is he going to block him in the middle right? Looks like he's going to. He's not going to risk trying to get something higher than 105, but it gets 107. This is going to be just as good and blocks another opening there for Yuri. And it's going to be quite a tough call here for Yuri. I think he's going to wait a little bit longer. The reason why people are so patient with their rotations is due to the fact that even though there's only a minute left and we're into round three, it's very rare we get into the full nine rounds, which is why players don't seem to mind too much into how this is going to go, Great. as he does get 101 in the good. top right, and that is not good at all. So Zhu Senpai has got chances and he's got a lot of opportunities here. He got to have to land and nail this 101 with a great shot. So with all the time that he has got, he gonna have to channel every single one of the training session that he has gotten before, and he's just gonna go straight in for the vertical shots. 103, not that impressive, unfortunately. But he can take it back over again and then go for the 80 meter target straight afterwards. And I just got word in my ear that Monty did take down Spring two to zero just now, oh. and sadly he only got 102. So Zoo Zenpai, my friend, you can either go top, middle. Or you can go bottom right and clean this series up. Doesn't matter where you go, there we have it. Only a 36, but you know what? It doesn't it's matter. He got the job done. He got the job done and ended the, the, uh, the game off not exactly in style, but it's more of a. Uh, how do I say it? You know, you just want this to end as fast as you can. You know, yeah. it's kind of like a mercy to your opponent. <laughs> you know, you don't... It, it is definitely a very tough mental game in the event that you are on your seat and you are just watching your opponent take his damn sweet time to take that shot while you know you have clearly lost. This is it, <laughs> yeah. This is it, this is it. So, so Senpai, he almost, almost guaranteed his spot into the top four mm -hmm. considering he's probably defeated two of his biggest opponents here in Group B. As you can see, the only person left standing with that 2-0, to zero, LA1 is directly behind him going 2-1. and one. And I do feel like it's going to be between LA1 and Yuri going into that top two. But Jin has also put a win on the board. And sadly, Aiden is uh, on the struggle bus mm -hmm. as well as Tor both going 0-3. and three. So sadly, they probably will be knocked out of the competition. But exactly. as we mentioned earlier, Monty did take down Spring 2-0, to zero, which means he's been looking clean at the top of the leaderboard. So we know for sure that Tor and as well as Aiden, they can't move up anymore. Well, there are still a lot of different kind of chances by these other players. We could still see a little bit of a shift, but one thing's for sure, whichever player have managed to get themselves two wins, they are on a lead and all they got to do is probably just get one more game in and they pretty much has beaten half, more than half of the current groups. Yeah, this is it. And it's uh, a very tough group, uh, group out. I wouldn't say it's the group of death, but it is borderline considering Mecha Su is actually performing a lot better. Before, it wasn't really the group of death, but considering how much Mecha Su is actually averaging now compared to what he used to, I think it's safe to say it's a group of death now, but we're going to witness how things are going to go shortly. But Zhu Senpai is looking on the verge to qualify into the top four later on in that single elimination bracket, looking formidable, so to speak, as we could be having our next matchup very soon. It looks oh, like la ones going to be on stage. Excited. We've been talking a lot about him before. If you guys don't know, la one is having a comeback after a 15-year hiatus from the Halo 2 European scene and has come back for the Tic Tac Bo Esports world against Yuri. And this is the matchup I kind of feel like is make or break between the two. Whoever loses this matchup 
isn't going to be going through into the next stage of the uh, single elimination bracket. That's my prediction anyway. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so LA1 versus Yuri. Does both of them have equal scores at this point in time? Well, I haven't seen um, LA1 play a huge amount so far in this tournament. This is actually going to be the first time we've witnessed him here, but exactly. back in okay. warm-up, he was looking pretty good so far out back, and he seemed to be averaging quite well against Monty, but Yuri's also been looking very good as well. You saw that he's had moments of greatness and just... With Tic Tac Bow, one bad shot can literally cost you the entirety of this game, and you saw that a couple of times, mm -hmm. not in the last matchup, but just throughout the day so far. So this is going to be LA1's first time on the main stage here against Yuri. Yuri just came off the main stage, so he's like, oh, you shouldn't have even moved me back in the first place. I might as well just stood here at this point <laughs> and waited for my next opponent. But I do feel like for these two players, they both lost against those senpais, so first is out of the question. But whoever wins this, I feel personally, will make it into the next stage of the uh, tournament so far. So right off the bat, with Yuri starting, uh, starting off first, LA1, this guy, he naturally would want to right. contest as much as, uh, as much as can. 103. Okay, so this is gonna be a fun game. We will always try to predict if whether LA1 is taking over or playing it safe. I'm guessing take over. I would. I think I would as well. If I got the right rotation, I would definitely take over that for days. And you know what? Yuri's probably going to be thinking that soon. But just needs to be patient. He's just checking his lineups just to confirm what he would like to do. As he manages to get it. It's not super clean, but 105 should be enough. And we'll have to see if anyone's going to try and take it back over again, which we have seen in the past, or if he's going to go for a completely different route. So it seems like he's going to be a little bit patient, wait for the rotation he requires, and then try and go for another target. What I would expect LA1 would do, uh, to do, or rather both of these players to do, I, I'm expecting that, uh, that Yuri will play it safe, hit, the, uh, hit over to the corner and do whatever that he can. While LA1, once he notices that the corner is not that strengthened, if it's anything below right. 106, that will be a takeover. As such, LA1 will be pushing Yuri into an 80 meters shot, and that shot will be proved to be difficult. Beautiful, 108 there from LA1, now pushing back to 80 meters. Looking very, very good, but I feel like Yuri now, he can either go for the top left or maybe recommend taking over back the center and then bring the targets back to 70 meters. We're gonna see what he's gonna do here. Looks like he's gonna play it safe and go on the top left hand side. He needs really bare minimum 105 considering how LA1's been playing throughout this first game. Just consistently taking things over back and forth for these targets and just being an absolute nuisance and just wasting so much time for Yuri here is now he's only got 50 seconds left so could be going into the long game here depending on what this point is going to be on this top left target but he's yeah. going to see if he can try and grab at least 105 or more if he can but if not Eugene it looks like it could be LE1's win oh! and he only gets a 79 surely that's going to be a first game win for LA1 it's for sure the weakness of Yuri to try to hit a 80 meter shot in the meantime LA1 took no time at all to line that shot up and th th what was that 109 was that yeah <laughs> This guy Man's is looking good. He is looking very good. And the kind of gameplay that he shows us is the aggression that I want to look out for. To the point that I can think of uh, whenever I'm well looking at a play, just think of the riskiest, most aggressive play and throw logic out of the window. That's LA1. LA1 is showing no fear. Just it's kind of like a pride thing, like taking over your targets. Like, <laughs> I'll just take it straight back at you. But yeah, sadly. That one moment for Yuri did cost him massively. It's like I said, one bad shot, one bad target, it can change everything. And we witness that each and every single time. This is the level of competition we're witnessing between all these players here. Exactly. As now we're going to try and witness whether Yuri can bring this back and tie this because he needs victory or there's a good chance that he may be out on this group stage. So with LA1 starting the game off first, it's going to accelerate how LA1 wants to play his aggressiveness. At least if Yuri starts first, LA1 is going to have to take over the middle, have to take over the uh, the corners right. as well. That's an additional round into it in order uh, before he can lay that double opportunity trap onto his uh, very unfortunate opponent. Yuri though, it seems like he wants to play eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But unfortunately that 
did not quite work out for him. And he pretty much dug himself into a hole here where only one can put one into the corner and put Ray. Oh, that's different. 107. So, again, Yuri needs to block that top middle or try and take over that 106 in the center. It's a really tough call here because this is going to be making make or break his tournament lifeline. He's actually going to He's gonna gun try and approach the center, which is uh be interesting to see, see if he can make it happen. It's gonna be a huge risk, but it'll massively pay off and bring him back as much as he can, but he doesn't, Ooh. yes, equals 106, which means LA1 is gonna secure things in that top middle spot and win this series outright. So for Yuri now, even though he loses this matchup, you gotta remember that he's gonna have to hope that LA1 loses against one of the other players in his Great. group. But nicely done there from LA1, 104 in the top middle. Dominating stuff. There's a good chance we may be seeing him later on in the single elimination bracket. I gotta have to say, it's relatively heartbreaking to see Yuri unable to take a single point away from LA1. I mean, understandably, when it comes down to these kind of risk factors that LA1 plays, you can either go really big and really just flat out win against LA1, or you just lose in the most impossible manner. So, in both games, Yuri was on the shorter end of the stick and he was proved to be hit on by the latter rather than the former. As we're switching over to D-Chan versus Ray. Spring now, D-Chan currently in the lead. And then some people may have been saying this is actually the group of death in group A. D-Chan manages to grab the center. And we're going to not. see what Spring can do here to try and bring this back. Is this waiting for the correct rotation? Great. Only That's he's not good. 97, and that is going to cost him. That will. 97. And Dijan having the opportunity to take that over. I, I, I don't think that he will want to pass off the opportunity any time at all. With a 106 double opportunity for Dijan in the next few rounds. And Spring, he's going to have to take over the 106. Or he would want to look at any other opportunities that he could drag out of Dijan. Because blocking this one point off. It could spiral out of control because in the very event that Spring just doesn't hit a good shot there, Dijan will just take it over. And that's a complete diagonal win for Dijan with not a single red marker on the board. Again, trying to take over this top right. See if Spring can do it to keep himself in this matchup as Dijan has been performing extremely well from the get go here at the Olympic Esports Series. He's going to go for it, but he's only going to get 103. Ooh. I respect that, don't get me wrong, but it looks like D-Chan is going to secure victory here with a 2-0 series win. Great. Nicely done there with 105, Eugene. D-Chan with a 2-0 against Spring. I gotta have to say, he is definitely on fire. The only one so far that we have seen on the stream to score a double bullseye, albeit in two separate occasions, but it is still in a very impressive feat. As such, this win should very well propel D Chan all the way to the top, top of the board. I think it's fair to say that he has gotten, what, three games won or something along those lines? So he's, he's on a very safe spot. No, he certainly is indeed. I think uh, Monty is probably in the safest spot, isn't he, at the moment? Coming going two or three to zero right. in his group. But on the other side of things, it's what I want to focus on as well. So Senpai looking like he should absolutely qualify from Group B. He hasn't lost a single series so far. But LA1's next biggest challenge was going to be Yuri, and he took him down. So that was one of his other main contenders which could push him out from the second place spot. So depending on how the other two players are going to perform against him, we'll have to see later on as we're now going to get underway with stage round five very shortly here to see how things are going to unfold in this next matchup here. But Monty looking better and better as time has progressed. Sadly for Spring, losing to D-Chan earlier on, but D-Chan has massively improved from what we've witnessed compared to what we've seen the last couple of days in the practice area. Mm -hmm. And what you've got to remember is it's not always going to be all but lost for Spring because you've got to remember he can also take down Mekasu. Mekasu could also take down D-Chan later. So this is what I mean by this kind of tiebreaker situation here because there's some top dogs in that group A and it's very hard to decide how he's going to 
come out on top, but Monty's looking to be one of the favorites to get out of Group A. And these kind of games is what we're looking out for, where it comes down to kind of like a rock, paper, scissors matchup, right? You never really know if one player is really going to be dominating the board. There could be chance that that kind of margin of error that we're looking out for could ultimately be the downfall of one of these players. But let us take the time to take a look at the standings. We'll look at Group A first. With Bond today, as you were talking about, he did manage to get himself a total of three wins with not a single loss as just yet, while Dijon in a two one fashion. Spring with two is to two and Mekasu with one is to two. Tori B uh Tori with A zero to three. So with all of that points in here, I think that is relatively safe to say that group A, we have got our top two very close, unless, like you were saying, the rock, paper, scissors game starts. Well, it looks like Zoo Senpai, LA1 and Monty have pretty much guaranteed their spots from what we're seeing on their win records, but group A is still very tough to decide how he's going to come out on top. I still feel like a tiebreaker is almost inevitable, but it depends on this next match in particular. This is the one I was saying. If Megasu takes down D-Chan, then it's all up in the air. It's yes. completely all up in the air, considering. I need to obviously hear a bit of a reminder in terms of uh, how Megasu is performing. I think he was going one and two, not 100% here, but D-Chan's been looking so solid, it's going to be extremely hard. But Megasu knows that this is a must win for him to continue his journey. He's going to have to do it. If anything else, all the other matches, it's, they're not important. This is the one that is important as we go right down to the wire. Mekasu has has got a lot of uh, a lot to prove. This is not necessarily the game for him to uh, for for him to lose. This is the game for him that he would want to win in order to still be in the competition or perhaps even drag Dijan down. Yeah, this is going to be a, a tough call here. I'm sure Spring is going to be staring at this matchup to see who's going to come out on top. And so Senpai as we saw earlier on, managed to win out almost his Group B. Still hasn't dropped a single series. And it's going to be a tough ask and a tall order for some of these players to try and take him down. But when I saw him averaging 107, 108, like it's his day job, just making it look so easy. But it really isn't at all. It's such a difficult game to contend with. And it's very rare to see 110s. But we've seen D-Chan get a couple already so far exactly. in these last few matchups. But Megasu just in that zen now, just trying to mm -hmm. relieve himself a little bit and just try and focus on this next match because this is definitely going to be a make or break situation for him. I think we have got a great amount of airtime on most, if not all, of these players. And this is where now I ask you, which player is the most similar to you in terms of gameplay, game style, and perhaps even accuracy? Oh, to me personally? To you personally. I'm not too sure. I can't say LA1 because I feel like I'm just very impatient with my shots and I'll just take it within like two seconds flat. Uh -huh. um, a little bit similar to Mekasu, I'd say, a from what I've witnessed so far, yeah. But it, it's weird because he changes his pace and his style and how he plays. I'm a very patient person, but in the back of my mind, I'm always worried if it goes to like round seven or eight where I don't really get the chance or the opportunity to be a little right. bit cool and collective with my shots. Ooh. But a 98 from D-Chan. Not Look the at best of starts, face. mind you. Exactly. But remember, though, that was his first shot. So, and he obviously he's the person going first. So it's not a huge loss. But if he went second and got a 98, I'll be extremely that worried be for him. Yeah. So at least for the uh, for D-Chan, I mean, I like that comical reaction coming from him, you yeah. know? <laughs> Especially the time where he strike a pose, and then now when he, he struck in, in, in uh, 98, he's confused. You can genuinely see the confusion in his face, and it's just like, how did that work? <laughs> oh, okay, and, it, and, and then the math tallies up in his head like a few seconds later, and like, okay, right. I got it. As it, in that comic value, too, yeah. is he really? It's just, he's uh, tune himself to the game. Yeah, you know, the first it, shot, warning shot. Exactly, exactly. As Megasu does get 105, so great response there. As D-Chan now, a less of the 98s, my friend, and a bit more of those 105s, or a little bit higher if you can. So we're going to see he's got two ways of going about this. He could maybe put up a much higher score and retake the center once again, or we could just go for something completely different. It's uh, Obviously entirely up to him in terms of what he wants to do in terms of game plan here. So it looks like he's looking to go to the left-hand side. Does get oh, 110. This guy. Third one. It's Third the one. only guy so far and he's hit three of them. Unreal. Three. three bullseye. So I think that we have a very good idea how D-Chan generally gets his, uh, his bullseye. He 
always want to play according to the direction of the wind. As long as the rotation is moving together with the uh, together with the wind, he's got his his vertical axis is impeccable. So honestly, the only thing that he gotta have to work around is his horizontal axis, and from that point on, is pretty much a simple game. I wish it was simple. I really, really do. It, it trust me, it looks a lot simpler on paper, but honestly, extremely difficult game and extremely tough to get some of his frame perfect shots. Too. And the pressure on top of it, shaky fingers, no chance. That's oh, all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> and let's not forget about the fact that most of these players will always draw out their ball for extended periods of time if the focus, uh, if the, if the uh, focus stats is not that high. The sway, oh, I wait, what? I think the rotations? I think he might have misread not just the rotation, but in terms of the direction it was going in, because that did seem a little bit strange. But yeah, sadly, a rookie mistake coming up from D Chan. You, you just hit 110. You've just hit exactly half that. He's even debating it as well, but it doesn't matter. The third 105 in the row coming up from Mekasu. He's having a bit of a giggle, knowing that he's going to take that cleanly after what we just witnessed. And D Chan, it's, we've seen moments of greatness, and then we've seen shots like that. You cannot afford to make shots like that. The fact that he just hit a bullseye 110 third time for the entirety of his tournament and then just gets a 55 like that. I'm pretty sure it wasn't rotation-wise. I think he maybe just I think misread the situation entirely. Slipped finger even. There could Possible. be a chance that it's like a slipped finger or something along those lines. Because, I mean, the flashes of brilliance coming in from d -chan is just so bright and to s for him to be so deep in the tunnel, being able to see such a bright light, but yet still in such a deep, dark chasm, I don't believe it. No matter how good you are, no matter how consistent you are, if you're able to get consistent 110s, I think that is something must have gone very wrong in order to go sub-80. This is what I mean. He's had moments of greatness and then total opposite end of the spectrum, and that was the perfect example. He knows the lineups. You he knows damn well yeah. know he does. Like the 110s, he's the only one I've seen actually get 110s on the main stage, and he's had three of them so far. But I think he's just having a bit of a word about something. It, it could actually be something else, um, a little bit more cryptic, but I think uh, you can see that DHM just having a word with one of the admins just to discuss things further before going into the next, next game. But does it change the fact that for Megasu, he has won that first game? and he could throw a massive spanner in the works in terms of Group A. If he does take this, we'll have to see very shortly, and I'm sure Spring's going to be keeping an eye on this matchup as well to see how things are going to unfold. It's going to be very important for him, but Monty's sitting pretty in Group A, isn't he, at the moment? No one's taking him down. No, he's, uh, he's had a bit of a challenge here and there, but uh -huh. he seems to be sitting up pretty in first place. I mean, the narrative that we're looking out for, whereby it is ju just a game of rock, paper, scissors, is definitely still in play. But for now, while, we, uh, while we're waiting for Mekasu and D-Chan's game, we're going to move off to take a look at Jayen versus Yuri's game, which is going to, uh, which is in Group B. So Jin, we haven't actually seen any of him so far. So Not this yet. is going to be a, a good time for him to, for us to witness what he could bring to the table. I see the young 103 lad, coming up from Yuri. He looks very young. Yeah, he certainly is. He's definitely been a bit of a grinder uh -huh. coming into this matchup. But I did witness that previous. 80s scoreline, which is uh, a little bit of a worry. So this is why Jin now is going to try and be very patient to try and take this shot over. Oh! Sadly, completely misses a rarity what? itself. So now Yuri going to reposition and take this top left target. Probably could be a man of a time. But this is the second game Great. in the series, by the way. It's currently 1-0 compared to what we may have witnessed. Yuri now looking to try and seal the deal and take this best of three, two to zero. But even though he was a bit frustrated with the 97, I think against Jin so far, from what we've witnessed with his averages, it could be okay here. Oh, no, maybe not 110. That, is it. that makes up for the previous miss, Eugene. Absolutely perfect. And he didn't waste any time at all. It seems like he found a lineup. He knew what he wanted to do. 110, let's go. At least this is a moment of redemption for him. This way, his, he didn't lose anything. We're back to square one, as though we're looking at a fresh round three, where Jayen is starting off as a second player instead. 
Yeah, very hit and miss with Jin. Hitting 80s earlier and then just comes out with 110. It's like he heard me and proved me wrong. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? But does this what we love to see here? Upsets if it's uh, oh? any kind of potential. So he's going to try and go for that centre target. He doesn't get it, only oh. gets 100, which means Yuri now can go for the middle right hand side and clean this matchup up 2 to 0, which he's going to be planning to do shortly here. And just going for that to that previous matchup between Mekasu and D Chan. We're just waiting for a situation to arise in that first game to see if it's going to be continuing on to the game number two or if we're going to have game one to be replayed. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't blame Vian at all. Though. No. 103 and 101, those are very enticing. If I were to be playing that game, I'm, I'm chowing down like a hungry toddler, dude. <laughs> Don't blame you. I think we're just still in discussions at the moment. And I think they're just debating on how things are going to continue on with that series. Because if you just missed it, if you're just joining us, we're still in the group stage here at the Olympic Esports Series for Tic Tac Bow. And we're heading towards the end, so to speak. As so Senpai currently hasn't dropped a single match and neither has Monty on the other bracket. So we've already seen Moments of greatness across the board for a lot of these players, but we're just trying to find out who could be potentially placing second for another spot in the top four of this elimination bracket. So, word from uh, word from the voices in our heads, we do have, or we will be looking at uh, D Chan as well as Mekasu playing off of the uh, out uh, away from the center of the stage, as we do have a little bit of a um, some something going on there, right? So we have not much of an idea what's going on, but they're playing they're playing off stage because unfortunately. Neither one of them is very likely going to be moving on to be the top two finalists uh, moving forward. So that decision has been made. As such, very likely, this is the end of the group stage round number five. D-Chan as well as Mekasu will continue their game right now, probably off, uh, off cam. But once the standings comes in, we'll have a very good idea who's going to be the top four coming in from both of these groups. It certainly will do. I think... If my memory serves me right, but you've got to remember, at my age, it's uh, I'm an esports pensioner, so uh -huh. don't blame uh -huh. me if I mess this up. But I assume it will probably be like Monty versus LA1 and whoever plays second in Group A versus So Senpai. So some very intense matchups if that does happen. Of course, could be completely mistaken here. We will get the formats up shortly to show you guys exactly how things um, could be progressing for that top four. But as you mentioned, though, group stages are already done and dusted. And I want to ask you something here, Eugene, actually. Sure. Yeah. Is there anything in particular from what we've seen for the entirety of this group stage, any ridiculous shots which, you, which gave you a bit of a shock to the system or any matchup which you had a particular favorite on? I generally love to watch LA1 play. I mean, I think that uh, any, anyone from all over the country could pretty much smell it coming in. You I've know? got to uh, represent my <laughs> British preference. <so. laughs> LA, I just absolutely love his pl uh, play style, his gameplay, and uh, his uh, unrelentless um, aggression on the board. Well, if we're talking about surprise, if we're talking about things along that realm, I think that would be D-Chan. Watching his qualifiers games, I've never seen anything like this before. I haven't seen anyone hitting a bullseye. I, I don't remember, at least. So watching D-Chan getting such uh, impressive 110 shots, and in critical moments at that, I got to have to give it to him. The fact that, sadly, he probably is out of the competition, but he hit so many 110s and then just somehow come out of the woodwork with the 90s and the 80s. Absolutely crazy. And this Ooh. is the matchup I have been waiting for with Monty versus LA1. And if you guys not too sure what happened in the qualifiers leading up <laughs> to this tournament, these two played against each other in the grand finals in the qualifiers. Monty did come out on top 3-2. to two, but the question is, is the story going to repeat itself? Oh, unfortunately, it's not going to be kind of like a double elimination thing going on anymore. Huh? Not anymore. So no. from, from my understanding is Group A first seed fighting against Group B second seed. And then we do the same thing for the other hand. So LA1 on the second seed 
that is definitely not something that he wants because it's pretty clear that he would want to only meet Monty Day in the f grand finals. And so Zenpai was the one who put a stop to that, didn't he? He made sure he did. that because neither player wanted to play against him. Of course, exactly. Monty, one of the favorites in the competition. But um, so Zenpai knew and probably had a fair feeling that if he did play second in Group B, there's a very good chance he will face against Monty, considering uh -huh. his extremely high level of consistency across the board in just previous tournaments, community tournaments, and some of his main tournaments as well. And he wants to avoid him like the plague, perfectly understandable, which means that, you know, a potential grand final between LA1 and Monty, we're going to get it in the semi-finals instead. So it's going to be a real treat for us to see exactly how things are going to unfold, as I'm extremely excited to see how things are going to turn out between these two titans. Exactly. Now, between LA1 and Zhu Senpai, what we are looking at is a not-so-conventional, quote-unquote, luck of a draw, because that's not much of a luck involved. So, technically speaking, this is a skill of the draw, you know? Absolutely. Who, whoever picked the short end of the stick gonna have to meet up with the Colossal, the Titan, the Monty Day. And this guy, we, it's, it's relatively safe to say that we would want to see him in the Grand Finals, but fighting and going up against LA1, we can expect very unorthodox plays coming in from LA1. Yes, if history repeats itself again, LA1 will lose to Monty Day. But I'm pretty sure that LA1 has, um, has prepared himself for this very moment. In the event that he does meet Monty Day in the Grand Finals, he's gonna have to work on something here. So, he's gonna be meeting Monty Day a lot earlier than his, uh, that he has previously expected. He's gonna have to work something here. He certainly does. I find it quite funny, actually. In the practice zone uh, a couple of days ago, uh -huh. um, I think uh, Monty was going on about, he normally goes by decimals in terms of the lineups. And then uh, LA1 was like, LA1 was like, what do you mean? And Monty went, don't worry about it. So it's like, he's, he's trying to hide like every little bit of detail um, from him. And good thing he did because he's now facing up against him in the semi-finals. So if you're just joining us, guys, of course, we're now in the top four. This is a single elimination bracket, still a best of three. Grand finals will be a best of five. As now our first semi-final is going to be between LA1 versus Monty Day. And again, a bit of context, these two players did face against each other in the previous tournament in the top 32 qualifier, where LA1 did lose to Monty Day 3-2, but it was a nail biter. It was extremely close between the two. Very hard to kind of pick up and decide who was going to come out on top, but now we're going to see if history will repeat itself. Very excited to see how this storyline is going to continue as this is kind of like a grand final, so to speak, but we've been treated it as a semi-final, so we really can't complain here, Eugene. I really do wish to have my fingers still intact by the end of today. <laughs> I definitely don't want to bite my fingers off for, uh, based on this nail-biting experience. But here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be diving right in for our very first semi-finals games between Monty Day versus LA1 with Monty Day starting off at the bow first right. and taking a 107 in the center of the board. That's exactly what Monty required in LA1. He's actually going to try and, no gonna way, try and no, retake back. No I was going to say, it's a, it's a slightly ballsy play, but do you know what? He may have to take over at some point, but no, he's going to be very patient. I know what Mr. First in is like. He's very patient in these situations and keeps that high level of consistency there. But he's looking for something that suits him. As the wind conditions is one kilometre towards the west. He's going to go for it. Gets a 99. Oh. He's even laughed it off a little bit. He knows that that was a huge blunder. But it does mean that he has either two choices if Monty does take this bottom left. Either just cover the top right and block him off, or maybe take over one of those two targets again. As he goes for it, manages to get 104. Okay. Not the safest, but mm -hmm. it's enough to give him a huge amount of leeway. I think shouldn't we be a problem for LA1? We can go back to square one again. It's like as though his missed shot didn't happen. The only thing that changed is the target bot moved from 60 meters to 80 meters. That's all. Oh, Ooh. actually Ooh. tried to go for it. Only Bye. hits 100. That does mean, though, Monty is going to bag that top right and this first game in the series. This uh, <sighs> bottom left has not really been LA1's best friend here, but also at the same time, Monty did get first shot in this coin flip. So it does mean in game two, LA1 will have 
at least that slight advantage Great. going up next to the coin. If it only gets a 98, but doesn't matter. The game is done. The damage has been done. And that is going to be Monty with the first game in this series. One more game away from the grand finals. Not a great start for LA1, isn't it? I mean, no. This is the one we're looking Very for. Very uncharacteristic, I think. Yeah. I mean, a semi-finals best of three, I got to say, this is really punishing, right? After playing all the way through, uh, through the group stages and in the semi-finals, you make one blunder, you lose one game. You make a second blunder, you lose the entire thing. Yeah, it's... Uh, that last game was a clear example of that. So, LA1, he's got a tall order here. Monty looking very sharp, very focused here. Again, that consistency continued to show. And I think this is actually what happened in the grand finals of the previous qualifier, where Monty had a huge lead and then LA1 was coming back. Again, we'll have to see if that happens again. But I know what LA1 is like. I know he's been having a hiatus over the last 15 years in the esports world, but in terms of adaptation, he was one of the strongest, which is why I made sure never to practice against him in the 1v1 format. Uh -huh. And I'm going to continue to do that <laughs> even now here. But Monty looking very good here as LA1 is going to be starting things off in this second game. And with that slight advantage, we'll see now if he can equalize this series. It is relatively clear to see that LA1 could come back into this game. As long as he don't make any crucial mistakes, which honestly it doesn't it, it doesn't happen very often, but uh, it could right. definitely still happen. 107, right in the nail in the head. 107 in the center of the mark. Monty Day generally plays a safer game, goes over to the corners and forcing LA1 to either play on the adjacent as if his score is high. Wind conditions three kilometers to the west, so it's going to be quite heavy here. So I hope they've practiced these lineups Great. thoroughly. Oh, okay. 98 coming out from Monty. Is this now, a deja vu? It is a deja vu, but the wind conditions are a little bit stronger this time. It kind of tells me is the how experienced Monty is with the lineups with three kilometers an hour. But LA1 seems to be in cruise control here. He can just do the exact same as you just rightly mentioned, Eugene, just taking over that 98. And if it's going to be a high scoring Lineup coming up from LA1, then Monty's going to be in a little bit of trouble here as he goes for it and gets another 107. So he's going to have to go to the bottom right and yeah. block this. Yeah, he's going to have to do that. Is an, this is not really an either or situation anymore. You would want to make LA1 take more shots because 107 and 107, that's no difference. You can go either one or, uh, either one or the other. But if you do, oh! That's not Monty yeah. Day. I think he may have fired it just as it was rotating. Monty's realised he made a massive blunder oh there. LA1 boy. is going to bring this back, get another 107, 107 on the board again. three times in a row. And yeah, that was a pretty crazy stuff here. One apiece here, Eugene, as now next person to win this matchup, or this next game rather, they will be in the grand final. So oh. yeah, it was funny, but just basically a complete role reversal from what we witnessed in that previous game. It all boils down to, technically speaking, who starts off first. Because it has, all, it, it has been a pattern now. Whoever starts off first pretty much have got the control of the game. That's number one. Number two, well, I think that's pretty much it. As long as you have the control of the game, you pretty much control how the opponents react to you and how you, you yourself can um, just kind of play around the board. Take overs or force them to play in the corner, followed by the adjacent. Do they constantly go for a stop onto your game plans? Or do you just want to take over their board? And that is what I love about Tic Tac Bow. It's not that linear kind of gameplay anymore. There's a lot of crossovers, and there is a lot of things that you can do still. I totally agree with the fact that if you're the person taking the first shot, you're, you dictate the pace and the tempo and how things are going to go your way and just block in any kind of winnable possibility for your opponent. But I kind of feel like Monty may have been a little bit inexperienced with the wind mileage there, with the resistance. Not 100%, but it just seemed a little bit too much of a coincidence with the scoring he was hitting. It so like, yeah. it could be possible that he was actually inexperienced for three kilometers an hour, because normally majority it's of the two. time it is zero to two. And 
LA1, I know he's a little bit experienced with three kilometers an hour, which is why he's just thrown 107s like, you know, like it's candy pretty much. Like it was just perfectly fine. I kind of feel like the worse the wind conditions are or the resistance, <laughs> the better he plays. It should be the opposite <laughs> way around. But you know what? Hats off to him here because it does mean we're going to go to our third and final game here in this first semi-final. Who wins the next matchup is going to be Ooh. going into the grand finals here. And it's now dropped down back to one. So we could be seeing a much closer Great. affair here with 104 coming out that's for Monty and also taking first shot. Yeah, that's not good though. LA1, knowing, uh, I mean, if he's going to be playing based on his character, that center board is going to be glowing red instead. So LA1 goes for this shot and this is only Jesus. one kilometer to the east. Getting himself a 109 and pushing the board further to 70 meters. Monty Day has got quite a big shoe to fill. He certainly does. That was huge from LA1. 109 to retake back the center target. And now Monty's looking to pursue his next one. Now drifting back to 70 meters. Only one kilometer to the east, mind you. So it's not three kilometers to the west like it previously was, which is pretty uh, pretty crazy for what right. we're normally used to here. But that was very good for Monty. 107 just to give him a layer of security for himself. And maybe extra insurance depending on where LA1 is going to go next. As we've seen 307s in a row, 109 takeover in the center. He's been averaging extremely well so far looking to go for the top Wait. middle target and That's he gets good. in 101 and you can see the slight shake of the head and now for monty a massive risk from his side is he going to retake that top middle 101 or is he just going to block off bottle middle for safety I, if, if it was me i would probably go for the top middle but it depends how good monty is with that 80 meter range top middle will mix would make more sense to me. Mm. Generally, since um, LA1 will take the very first shot to shoot that 80 nice. meter shot. So that is all gonna be great. And LA1 is pretty much forced to cover up the top left. I don't think that he'll want to go for the center uh the the center top the top center one. No, he has to go for the top left. He, he can risk to. going for the 106 considering in his law of averages so far, but Personally, I would go top left and force Monty to then block bottom right. But again, it depends on how high the scoring is for the top left. This is the issue because he's been averaging well, but it's going to be a tall order in itself. Because even if he gets a high average anyway, it's gonna, he's going to be thinking to himself, I might as well take the top middle back anyway. But it would not surprise me here as he's just taking his sweet, sweet time. Got 45 seconds left. He decided to go towards the top left hand Ooh, side. Getting 101. A slight giggle there from LA1. But Monty now, he's got such a huge decision to make. It's going to be make or break to make into the grand final. Does he want to take over that top left 101 and then pursue into the grand finals? Or does he want to block from bottom right? If it was me, I would go for the top left. You would go for the top left. Yeah. It's a 101. Because you need to hit a high scoring anyway, and 101 that isn't is going to be good enough, so it makes perfect sense. 101. This is tough. I mean, looking at the fact that it's 80 meters, but yet we're looking at one kilometer to the east. Monty Day might be a little bit more comfortable with this uh, with these one kilometers. Well, 80 meters, I don't think that that's a tall order. He's going to go for it, and oh! he actually gets it 106 in the top left. It's risky, but at the same time, it if worked. you need to get a high score anyway, uh -huh. you might as well just take over the top left. And we're going to see Monty Day into the grand finals, but commiserations to LA1. He played so, so well, but it's not over yet for him, as we will see him in the third place playoff later on. We do have quite some time before that will happen. We're going to be looking at the next semi-final game. I believe that we will have Zu Senpai versus... D Chan, okay. So this is gonna be a tough game to watch. I gonna have to say, right? D Chan has got great games so far, 110s, pretty consistently. I gonna have to say. So, uh, however, how, how that is going to play out, and who is going to be facing off against LA One in the bronze uh, bronze games, or who's gonna be going up against uh, our friend at the top side? So, I don't think that. Either one of them, Zeus and Pires or D Chan, would definitely want to drop down to third place. So they're gonna do their very best here. 
They certainly will do. We thought DJ was getting close to going out, but we're going to see him continue on here in this second semi-final. Zeus Empire still hasn't dropped a series at all for any competi sorry, the competition. Neither has Monty, and we'll be seeing him in the grand final later on. But this is for the next spot into the grand final between Zeus Empire and D Chan. Two very formidable opponents. We've already seen D Chan get three or four bullseyes already. He's just been throwing it out there and. It's been quite weird with D-Chan. We've seen, uh, again, moments of greatness from him. He's been getting uh, so many high scores, 110, 108, three multiple, multiple times. Three, exactly, at least. And then we had some weird 80s and 90s, but I think that was just maybe cut off on some of those rotations, which we've seen time and time again. Mm. But he's rectified his mistakes. These are actually mistakes. Normally, a lot of the time, I will say he can't correct these mistakes overnight, but you can do. In those kind of situations, he's realized he just needs to be a little bit more patient and just wait for that next rotation to come by a little bit later on. But he's been looking very good, but Zoe Senpai has been, been looking like a formidable opponent and a juggernaut throughout this competition so far. As both of these players find themselves in the center of the stage, they are preparing themselves to rumble against one another. And I gotta have to say that they are definitely on fire when it comes down to their own individual group play. So, going up against these two, who do you think have got the advantage? Or rather, who do you think have got the higher skill level? I would say Zo Zenpai's hitting the more the higher averages so far. He's been hitting in the warm-ups 107, 108, and he's been looking even better like on the main stage, which I didn't think was actually impossible. Yeah, a very high level of consistency there, but uh -huh. with D-Chan, it depends what he can pull out the woodwork. So seeing some frame perfect 110s back-to-back -back on the odd occasion gives me sign of hope, and the potential is there, and I think Zo is going to be a little bit worried about that to a certain degree. But I kind of feel like the way Zo Senpai has been playing so far, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him in the grand finals. But honestly, it's anyone's guess so far. We've already had a potential grand final in that previous semis between LA1 and Monty. And if you're just joining us, Monty Dave was able to, to, to actually take that. But we'll be seeing LA1 in the third place playoff straight after this match. But going back into the second semi final, go back to what you're saying. Zo Senpai has been looking extremely strong. It doesn't seem to matter which route he wants to take, but he's been in a lot of areas a very strong opponent in terms of mental game and it doesn't seem to matter too much about the resistance of the arena or what arena it's on or which pattern he has to take he seems to be just very strong in all areas and it's going to be a tough ask here for d champ but as long as we don't see any kind of un un sorry uncharacteristic moves from in terms of the scoring earlier on then d chan could definitely put a spanner in the works as we slowly come into the second round, we are in. And Zou Senpai is going to go up against D-Chan for this semi-finals. Zou Senpai starts things off first. And understandably will be taking the center of the board while he's still at 60 meters. D-Chan, he's, he's a very passive playstyle, yet very accurate playstyles right. in, in, in the same time. is definitely going to be quite a good mark for him because Zeus Empire has so far in a couple of four, uh, a couple of games or two, his averages are not necessarily super high. While D Chan just pops off whenever he wants it to, or sometimes in random occasions. Yeah, this entire Olympic esports series here for Tic Tac Bo has been absolute pandemonium. It's going to continue back with D Chan. Fantastic start. Bang on into the center with that 108. And Zu Senpai, you know, it's going to be uh, a challenge going for this next target. He, he's seen the high level consistency coming out from D Chan. And it's been extremely patient here. Only round two. 40 seconds have already been removed from the clock. He's going to go for it though. He's oh. only going to get a 79. That's the first <laughs> blunder we've actually seen from Zo Zenpai. Very yeah. uncharacteristic from him. Oh, it's very bad. It's so very bad. Zo Zenpai, 79 on the board. It will eventually be a zero. And Dijan waiting for the perfect rotation, waiting for the perfect timing to eventually get that target at the bottom left hand corner of the board. And that sets things up. If Dijan were to get 110, then that would be amazing. But unfortunately, that's not what we're going to see. He's created some dire consequences for himself now. But remember, 
even though D-Chan did take over the bottom left, it was only a 96. It's not a big deal. Shouldn't be a big deal at all. So Senpai should take this even at the 80 meter range, depending on how good his lineups are with that two kilometer resistance. And this is going to be the big issue here. 80 meters, of course, very difficult, but it depends how experienced they are with these Ooh. lineups. And it's not going to happen, as I mentioned, 77. And the struggle bus continues for that bottom left target, but it means D Chan is going to take the top right and take this first Great. game in this best of three still. So D Chan looking a lot better, a, a lot, a few sloppy shots from both players, but when you've got two kilometer resistance and 80 meters, it is tough. It, it is really, tough. really is. You've got to really get the, the lineup so, so accurately. I feel it, I'm not too sure whether it was just me, but the further the target board is, it feels like you just don't land your shots. Even if the lineup seems correct, something seems a little bit off with my aim most of the time. Like, I know that my vertical axis for the 80 is right on the dot, but it just doesn't seem to connect well. With some arenas, they rotate very quickly, so you're very limited on time, and obviously waiting for those rotations to come by, it's uh, can be a bit of a pain as well. But D Cham, he's going to be starting first, and that's not great news for Zuzu Senpai. Absolutely not. So again, it could be dire consequences there. It could be Green Cracker, but again, D Chan another oh, one ten. Dirty D Chan, you can't do this. You can do this four times in a row! <laughs> and you can't do this in the semi-finals against Zeus and by starting things off! One way to oh. create a nice bit of morale here Wait. as he does get 109. So Whoa. that was a great response there as D Chan still continued to try and ride that momentum. It's the pinnacle of human achievement, really, getting these 110s. But D Chan's making it look easy so far, getting 109. What? These averages coming up from D Chan's ridiculous because it's so difficult to hit these kind of targets. It's only a one kilometer resistance, but still, though, riding that 60 meter range here, Eugene. So, honestly, there is still a lot of quote unquote mistakes right. that can happen. Both of these players are playing out of their minds. And let's be honest here, Dijon's average, his consistency in this game is so good. And even if he misses the takeover at the bottom middle, Zeus Senpai has got nothing to work out for him yet. So he can go for it. The worst case scenario is Zeus Senpai being able to play at the bottom left, uh, bottom left corner and set up a double opportunity. I respect that shot coming up from D-Chan. Even though he only got 104, it's perfectly fine. He can still go for this W. As we're going to see, so Senpai now the shot has room to breathe a little bit. It really is important. The bottom left will give him security in terms of being able to guarantee oh! the middle left on the bottom middle gets 110. That's game. Which means that is going to be Game for Zozenpai. Fabulous stuff there coming out as D-Chan now is going to be scratching his head and wondering what could have been if he took that bottom middle. Well, I can probably tell him now. He will be in the grand final sitting pretty here. But yeah, very unfortunate coming out there from D-Chan. But Zozenpai with a 110 of his own. D-Chan's probably thinking, well, you know, that's what I've been doing the entire time. But the good thing is oh! from D-Chan is the fact that it's ended now. We're going to be going to one apiece in the third and final game in this series. But D-Chan is looking a lot better. Before, he right. was actually hitting these one tens here and there, living off moments of magic. But now he's got that championship mentality. But Zenzo Senpai, he's got a lifeline now to keep himself in this match. One is through one, the current scoreline. Dijan, like you said, Dijan could have walked out of that. Two is to zero, comfortable fighting against Monty Day. But now it's all bringing down to the wire. Is an I is is a game for anyone. Is anyone's game to win? And this coin flip is gonna be that important. This coin flip will dictate the player who starts off first. And the same thing happens. Whoever starts off first generally have the advantage. What you said is 100% true, but what's quite funny is in this series, they've actually won each other's games on, the, on each other's oh, first shots, which is right. quite hilarious. So the fact that the probability of them winning 
their game uh, as the opponent taking their first shots a little bit lower, but it depends on how aggressive they are as a, an opponent to take over their targets. But it seemed like it's been quite crazy in terms of this happening. This is the first time this has actually happened in this matchup. So we're going to be starting underway very shortly. If you're just joining us, this is the second semi final. It's D Chan versus Zo Zenpai. Currently one apiece in this best of three. Whoever wins this will be going straight into the grand finals. And whoever loses. Could have an airport ticket home, but first we'll have to play that third place playoff later on. So two kilometers resistance to the west. It's going to be quite tough here. We'll have to see what D-Chan can give us here. Give us a good indicator of maybe what to expect and for Zoe's Empire to try and respond well. I think that this is a very common game for D-Chan to snag a 110. Oh, there we wow. go. As long as it's a two kilometers wind. Whichever he goes, to the west or to the east, he gonna have to find the right rotation. As long as the target ball is moving according to the wind direction, he can normally get that 110. D-Chan starting off with a 110 as those Empires responds with a 105. It's a decent response nonetheless, not a 107 or 108, but uh -huh. he will definitely take that. We've definitely seen much worse here. And for D-Chan, this is for his next decision, crucial decision as well, of how he wants to go about this. Does he want to take over that 105, considering how his high level of consistency is getting by very, very well? As I mentioned before, it was just living off moments of greatness. But now he's showing that Enjoyable. championship mentality here, as he is going to go for the top left. Anthony takes it as well Ooh. with 108. And so Zenpai is on the brink of being knocked out of this tournament. I definitely did not expect that play from D-Chan. It took a long time to really consider what uh, what rotation is going to go for. And generally, I thought that, yeah, he's going to go from the right to the left. But he didn't draw his bow until the final moment. And I thought that that could be a blunder. Because I thought that a rotation could have, Im could have changed right as the arrow hit. 108 or above could put a complete halt to D-Chan's victory here. So this next shot is going to be extremely crucial here for Zo Zenpai. As he's going to go for that bottom right hand side. Will he be able to get it? He only oh. gets 104. So a small amount of breathing room here. And D-Chan, does he want to risk it? He can. Absolutely no reason why so. he can't. He'll go for a very Wait. safe game to force Zo Zenpai to actually take over the 105 instead. Is, it is, after all, the weakest board available. And I think that this is very likely going to be one of the encouragements that Zhu Senpai will have for himself. It's the weakest board, and yet is also the most important board that D Chan presented to him. But no matter what, Zhu Senpai has to take this 105 in the middle left. He's just waiting for the correct rotation. The benefit of him as much as possible is going to go for it. He needs to hit more than 105. Oh. He manages to get it with a 106. There we go. So he's going to keep himself in it a little bit longer now as we head into the 80 meter range for these targets. As both these players are going to make things a little bit tougher for themselves heading into round four. And the time is ticking here, Eugene. But the round, the game is definitely not over just yet. D Chan took that shot out of nowhere and still managed to nail a 106. And what is who somebody going to be doing here? <gasps> he might actually go for the bottom left, which oh. is going to be quite risky. He could go for the top right to block, but again, another moment oh. to try and go for it. Only gets a 98. D-Chan just needs to go for the top right. Any point, doesn't matter to guarantee himself into the grand finals against Monty Day. And I'm sure that's going to be a slobber knocker in itself. But again, the respect, the risk there for Zoe Senpai. Could have gone on the top right, but with that scoring, if it was going to be like a, a low hundreds, he knows that D-Chan is going to take over straight away. But how D-Chan has been performing so far has been crazy. Wait. And again, oh. 103, probably one of the lowest scores we've seen so far in the last couple of series. But we will be seeing D-Chan in the grand finals against Monty Day. Sadly for Zoe's Empire, he's out of competition, but we will be seeing him in that third place match. I think it's relatively fair to say that D-Chan single-handedly managed to break a couple of records coming into the Olympic Esports Series for archery, huh? He's got probably the lowest point that is uh, that scored. Of course, let's I can not... see where this is going. Yeah, 
but let's not talk about the miss, right, from from, from Feyen, because there's no there's no point on the board at all. So he scored the lowest point, but in the meantime, he's got the most amount of one tens scored on the board, at least to the live audience. Yeah, it's been absolutely crazy. And funny enough, these two opponents have actually played against each other already in Group B, but now they'll be facing against each other again in this third place match. So Senpai actually defeated LA1 back in Group B, but now we have to face him again. Let's see if he can do a repeat of what we witnessed earlier on. So this third place match is also known as the grudge match for LA1. He gotta have to claim back the honor that he lost when he was facing off against Zo Senpai. And there's no other way to do that than to get a 2-0 scoreline against Zo Senpai and relegate Zo Senpai to a fourth place while he himself takes on the crown of third place. Yeah, but just discussing now before we get into our third place match. Again, if you're just joining us, the grand finals will be up straight after this third place match. That will be a best of five. That will be. This third place match will be a best of three. But I love the confidence from all these players here in this competition, what we witnessed so far in the Olympic eSports series, as some of these players have never even been on a stage in this kind of tournament environment, especially in this setting. And they've played it as though they've been on it for 10, 15, 20 years. Like, we're showing veteran experience across the board, which is incredible. Because, in my opinion, confidence is also a form of emotional intelligence. And we've seen it from every single one of these players here. As speak on the players, they're just getting themselves ready and prepped for this next series. It will be a best of three. We're going to see who's going to at least get a podium spot in this bronze match. And... So Zenpai, we'll have to see if history is going to continue to repeat itself as he did take down LA1 earlier on in Group B. And we're going to see if he can do it once more. He certainly can do. We've seen some incredible plays, some psychotic plays to a certain degree, considering how many risks he's been taking so far. And I always respect those risks, considering what we've seen so far with his averages. He's been averaging 106 to 108 for the entirety of his competition. Only a couple of slip-ups here and there. I think he did struggle on some of the 80 meter targets on a couple of arenas earlier. But apart from that, though, he's been looking pretty sweet on his lineups. And I think that it is very soon that we will jump into the game for the third place match between these two lads. I mean, right off the screen, I'm not too sure whether that is actually the, uh, the practice round or not, or is actually the game itself. So I think that, okay, that was the game itself, right? So Zo Senpai has found himself a 107 in the center of the board and LA1 will now take the next game or rather take, take the next shot right. with a 105 at the bottom left. Okay, so Zo Senpai with the first shot and also makes it a doozy as well with that 107. It's going to go for the middle right. left-hand side, gets 104. It's not the safest target, not but all. we'll give LA1 a tiny bit of leeway into this match. But I think that LA1 will still play a blocking game. I don't, I don't see 104, like taking over 104, do right. anything for him other than forcing Zo Senpai to, to hit the top left-hand corner. But yeah, it, it doesn't lead him anywhere. Completely agree. It's uh, a make or break moment. I did say that normally when you hit 102, 103, it's kind of like a very difficult oh. as 110 comes out there from So Senpai. Look at him, looks at Mark straight away as LA1 now needs to block this top left hand side to keep himself in this matchup. A minimum of 105 will, will be a nice little safety net here, Wait. but actually gets just 100, 100, which means So Senpai now takes over the top left, and if he does, he will secure his first game in this series. That will be the easiest target throughout the entirety of the board. And there's not really much of a necessity to kind of fill the board up. So targeting the, hun uh, the hundreds makes a lot of sense. But <gasps> Abe himself claimed at 97. Oh, as if oh, that happens. As if that happens, Eugene. It means that 
For anyone now, what decision is he going to make? It wouldn't surprise me if he did... Oh, he's actually going to go for the 104 in the middle left. So, so Senpai may have... He, he could actually go for the top left as well and get a higher number, but you can see right. LA1 isn't really oh. too sure. But the problem is he just adds on that one point as LA1 just having a bit of a giggle there, knowing that he could have done a tiny bit better. But for Zo Senpai, this is his opportunity now to try and come back in this, and he has done with 102. Just, just one, one point more. Unbelievable. Well, very uncharacteristic of LA1 to actually defend, or rather strengthen his own board. I would have expected that he would actually try to take the middle left board. Th I mean, that's the surefire way to win, right? And we're looking at, what, 104? If I'm not wrong, it should be 104. And 104 is a point that LA1 can surpass. LA1 clearly wasn't comfortable. Like, he wasn't comfortable with the resistance and the meters it was going by. I think it's because he's a little bit unsure of his lineups, which is why if it was 60 meters, zero or one kilometers now of resistance, then he probably would have 100% gone for that shot. Because right. it's, it's quite interesting, though, as well, like with some of these lineups that LA1 has made. Like, it's like I said before, with him, it, with like three or four kilometers an hour resistance, he's hitting 107 just for fun, like just on average, <laughs> like he's not really taking it seriously. Uh -huh. But with something like this, where it's a little bit less, it's, it's it's obviously knowledge on lineups, but at the same time, it could be in the rotations he's not getting either. So it's a little bit uncharacteristic once again. But so Senpai, he's going to be going up next here, taking his second shot as anyone gets a, a good solid start hit banging into the center. Perhaps we'll be able to see the second round goes to the hand of uh, LA1 just so that we can play this game all the way down to the end by the narrowest margin. So that is the kind of narrative that I would love to see. However, let's remember, LA1 is starting first and Zou Senpai is starting second. There could be a chance that Zou Senpai will end up dancing in the palms of LA1, unable to do much as long as LA1 constantly makes fabulous shots. 106 in the top left, just to be on equal footing here. As the resistance is two kilometers to the east. Throw a little bit of a spanner in the works. Is LA1 now just buying his time there, going to make his decision. In terms of his character traits, we haven't really seen him go mm. and take over some of his targets. Does get 105, so that will give him that safety net. And we'll have to see now how Zo Senpai is going to respond. Wouldn't surprise me if he does go over and block that middle right rather than going over one of those two targets because his, he has had a high level of consistency, but he's been a little bit hit and miss in terms of his recent form in his third place match. And now it boils down to Zo Senpai to take the next shot. 105 is definitely really enticing, but going for the safer route to block off LA1 would make sense as well. Well, LA1, he's got a 105 that he can take over, generally one point lower than 106 that he could have taken over uh, previously just now. So 105 wins him the game. And so that he will be able to move on to the next round or perhaps just play a little bit more on the timing, play a little bit more on the point system before committing into a takeover. LA1 now being very patient here. Already a minute 10 has passed. And we're only on the third round here as, again, just waiting for the rotation which he prefers. He realizes that Zou Zenpai is just hitting 105, 106 on average here for not just this game, but the entirety so far. Hits 105 oh, of his own, so his patience does pay off. And now we're going to see now Zou Zenpai go for that bottom middle target to see what scoring he's going to get. But if it's anything below 103, then it will give LA1 a chance to tie this series up. And with Zou Senpai hitting a 104, is constantly dropping the points. The points are constantly and gradually dropping. 106 and 105 and 104. Eloy finds the opportunity. And I think that he is hungry for more. But he's got to be careful though. He's only got 22 seconds left. He's not too sure if he's actually going to go for the bottom middle target and then take it over or just go for the bottom left hand side. He's only got 17 oh. seconds left, but he does get 108. And for anyone who doesn't know this at home, whoever, if you do actually run the time limit over, you get an automatic loss. So it's not actually based on total points. You just lose completely outright. So 
there's still five rounds left, so anyone literally needs to spam these targets as soon as he gets to play his turn. And it looks like Zozenpai gets a 99, which means now LA1 has 15 seconds to try and overtake that top right-hand side. He has to. If he doesn't, then it's going to be a bit of a question mark there. 110. Oh. What a way to do it as well. As it's one apiece as we head into our third and final game in this third place playoff. Ending that round in the most stylish fashion that anyone could have asked for. A bullseye for the final shot. 15 seconds left as well. 15 seconds. I saw how quickly he took that shot. <laughs> and you probably heard me and gone, actually, yeah, I need to spam these shots quick if I want to win it based on points. And uh, exactly. he's made that mistake once before back in the qualifiers where he actually had the board in terms of control. But the problem is because he um, ran the time limit out, he gets an automatic loss straight away. And not many people actually knew about that because we don't really see many of these top competitive matches go to the time limit or actually get to the ninth and final round. So obviously learn from his mistakes there and realize that, of course, with that 99 on the top right, Zo Zenpai actually gave himself room to breathe and could have been a little bit better, sadly. Maybe if he hit 105 plus, then that's when there would be a huge question mark for LA1. But LA1 knew that at some stage he would have to take over one of his targets. Anyway, it was just the fact that he had a 99 available and just smashed it with 110. Can't complain at all. Exactly. So there's really nothing that, uh, there's nothing that Zou Senpai could have done right after hitting the 99. The only thing that you can do, move on, next game. And next game it is, as we have Zou Senpai starting off for this round. It could go either way now, by the narrowest margin, teetering on a breaking point. Zou Senpai versus LA1, only one of these two lads could get themselves the third place trophy, while the other one gets nothing. Great. So Senpai takes his first shot, 107 in the center, looking very good. Resistance only one kilometers, so shouldn't be too bad in terms of lineups here. I know that LA1 was looking very good on three kilometers earlier on, but we'll uh -huh. see how he dabbles with one, as he's probably been one of the most patient players in the Tic Tac Bro scene so far. 105, he's going to take that. I think mm -hmm. he's going to be perfectly fine considering the averages that Zo Senpai has been putting out over the last couple of games. Yeah, that should be that, that should be okay. However, I think that LA1 would probably revert to the same game plan that he has worked with so far. And as long as he sees anything that is below of 105, I think that he will try to go for a takeover. Now it's kind of like an all or nothing bet. You can't get too far with playing safe, Wait. especially since Zo Senpai is on the lead. He's going to have to do something a little bit unorthodox or he's going to have to play a little bit riskier in order to put himself on top of Ali, uh, on top of Zou Senpai. If I was LA1 now, I'll just continue blocking until there's an opening. And we've yeah. seen that earlier on. We saw Zou Senpai had a very great amount of consistency, right. but at that nice. 99 cost, but 108, that was a huge block. If it was anything below 104, then Zou Senpai would have gone, all right, you know, we can, we'll, we'll give that a go. But that 108 was massive from LA1, and now Zou Zenpai is gonna have to rethink his decision in terms mm -hmm. of how he wants to go about this next. But all he needs to do is continue creating that winning path and for LA1 to continue blocking or maybe take over one of those targets. But Zou Zenpai hasn't really given him that opportunity yet. Oh, okay. Oh. Zou Zenpai! Great takeover! Down to the bottom left. And now forcing LA1 in a very tough position where he can't go for any other shot but the 108. He has to. He has no chance in any way, shape or form. The only way he's going to come back in this third place playoff is he has to take over with a almost frame perfect shot here. He has to go for the 109 or 110. And it's been a rarity a for LA1. We've seen him do it once before as those Empire just stand in his ground. You can see there just staring in the distance to see if anyone can pull this off as LA1, he's got 50 seconds on the clock, but he could take all the time in the world because this shot is going to be make or break. He's going to go for it, doesn't oh. get it, gets 104, sadly, which does mean for those Empire just needs to hit the top left or top right. And if he hits it, he's going to be going into the third place position. So he'll guarantee himself a podium finish here with that bronze medal. I absolutely hate one kilometer wins. I absolutely <laughs> hate it. 
and I think the LA1 feels that as well. But we move that aside as we have a winner in the third place match. It is definitely grim for our friend LA1 to not be able to make it, but Zou Senpai, he found himself in the third place match, Victor. And he is going to be crowned as the third place winner. We'll get back to Zou Senpai in a short little bit because the highlight of the show for the Olympic Esports Series 2023 finale is coming in real soon as we see the two players, Dijan as well as Monty Day in the center of the stage as they prepare themselves for this Grand Finals best of five games as to who takes home the first place trophy. A little bit of an un unlikely matchup here, but Monty Day came first in the qualifiers in the top 32 bracket, previously getting into where we are today at the Olympic Esports Series. D Chan, though, is no stranger to this situation. He did place third in the qualifiers in the top 32 and is now looking to, well, technically he's already done one place better already, but he can taste the gold in the water. And the story with D Chan and what we've seen so far in the last few hours has been incredible. We've seen him living off moments of greatness to some uh, really weird shots only hitting 80s and 90s but he's had a championship mentality now going into Great. this and it's going to give monty day a run oh. for this money but monty not the best of starts here with a 92 in the center and giving d chan a huge opportunity now to either overtake that middle target or to go elsewhere a questionable start for monty day but generally this is a, this is also not d chan's best wind he prefers to play on two kilometers and he prefers to play on a rotation from uh fr in a horizontal axis whichever that works with the wind that moves with the wind so right now one kilometer one kilometer wins gives you the most awkward placements the most awkward lineups is nowhere near any lines and you gotta have to move it slightly, a slight tad bit away from the 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 right shot. So, I can understand where all of these players are coming from. To try to aim for 110 in this kind of win is very tough to make a right, right. call. Monty with 108, but D Chan responding with 105. Still looking very good so far. It's like D Chan forgot how to struggle. He was struggling a little bit in the group stages, but now he's forgotten how to, which is just forgotten incredible. How to struggle. Yeah, forgotten <laughs> how to struggle. He literally has no idea how to do it now, but he's been looking far more confident. I don't know what just triggered it either, like, because he right. was hit and miss here and there. 106 coming up for Monty there, so he's going to continue with his high scoring games. And D Chan realizes that he just needs to continue putting this pressure on. I kind of feel like. One of these two players, anything 104 and below is just going to have that light bulb spark above their heads and give them that chance to take this first game. But D Chan, though, is waiting for the rotation he requires before scoping in. But he's been doing well so far. A couple of 105s on the board. Go for that 7 meter, right. meter range. Gets a 98, Ooh. and that's going to flare up for Monty. He's going to be taking over that straight away and realizes there's a slight weakness in D Chan's gameplay. Gets 103, not too not good, too, but yeah. you know, not too bad either. But it's going to be safe from a from an 80 meter target. Yeah, uh, Monty Day took, uh, did not waste any time at all. Generally, probably is also based on due to the time remaining. You know, especially when it comes down to a to a board that doesn't require a lot of aiming, that doesn't require massive positioning. Right. I think that he realizes that, you know what, as long as you take over the board, that's pressure. And that pressure itself will force Dijan to make another move. I don't have to get right. a 110 there, I just need it to be blue. Both players found their rhythm so far. Monty continuing with his high scoring game, pretty much in his DNA, so to speak. I'm sure everyone in the Tic Tac Bow community at home are very curious to see how he's going to continue to perform. But he's been doing very well for the entirety of his tournament. D Chan, he's been getting better and better as time's progressed. As he's going to go for that top left target, oh. not going to, actually equals it with 104 of his own. Such a shame there. It is. I thought that a better move right. were to go for this exact board. 
to take over mod or rather not take over yet but to take that board previously just now so that at least he have a chance to take over the 103 which is the weakest link on the board at this instant so Dijan I think that the main play he gotta have to work with is to take over the 101 instead of trying to block at the bottom left hand only 16 seconds left though, still got Great. three shots to hit Plain later safe. on. Does get 102, not too happy about that. Yeah. Which means that Monty, he's got 40 seconds left. All the time in the world, surely he'll be able to take this shot. Oh, he what? doesn't, he's actually messed things up at 34. Very uncharacteristic from Monty. But D-Chan, the problem on his side, he's only got 11 seconds left. He's got to take a few of his targets, but he's got to do it quickly. And he does, and he still manages it. to take it with 102. Brings the distance back to 70, and this next shot for the top left is going to be so crucial here for D-Chan. But Monty now, though, he's probably praying that he expires the time limit. Yeah, I think the only w one of the best ways that he can win is to make D-Chan expire the time limit. So the oh, yeah, it's kind of like an either situation. Aim for the either 102s, but. Oh, D-Chan actually trying to go for the 104 instead of the 103. But you can remember though, D-Chan could just buy any shot. It doesn't matter. He's actually winning in terms of scoring. So oh. he needs to instantly take his next shot to make sure. Because you can remember, if the tournament expires, he gets an automatic loss no matter the situation. So, so he's fine now. Yep, yeah, he is fine. But that's only if he takes his next shot. Right. Monty knows this, so he's been extremely cautious with his next shot. It's going to be his last one as well. He needs to take one of them over. He oh. doesn't. He gets only 100. But d -chan needs to spam this next shot. He's only got five seconds left. Just hit it anywhere. It doesn't matter Two, at this stage. But he's going to go for it anyway. Misses, doesn't matter. Do you know what? For d -chan, he's already got five targets at the nine, which means he's going to guarantee that wow. first game. The first time we've actually seen a nine-round banger. An absolutely nail-biting experience to watch. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the audience thoroughly enjoyed that game. That was the only game that really came down to the final second for one player, and we even had the game end by points instead of, oh, a three, a, a matching three. We've never seen that before, and to see that in the grand finals right here, right now, that is a treat. That was just the first game as well, and it's a best exactly. of five, so we're going to see a lot more of that. When I saw D-Chan still trying to line up his shots, I was thinking to myself, you've guaranteed your victory, my friend, just take it. And if it, the time did expire, I would have felt so bad for him, but it doesn't matter. It's all said and done. He's taken that first game in this best of five, as D-Chan will be taking the first shots here in the second game. And he does get 106, so lovely stuff there. Three kilometers to the west. Now, Monty oh, okay. actually struggled on this before right. against LA1, but he's looking much better this time around. 107 in the top right. Good stuff from both these players. It's still not the two kilometers win that d -chan is looking for, but I think, you know, it still generally right. work. He's going to go for a 103 at the right side of the board, and he's just playing according to what the general strategy is. Always play on the adjacent to the corner once it is once you're looking at the second round out. And Monty Day! That's what we want! That's the 110! The perfect! The bullseye! Right down to the right side of the board, right center. And now d is forced to respond with a bottom right 93. Oh, it's going to go from bad to worse here. This is going to be an extremely quick game too compared to what we witnessed in that first game. And you saw how far d had to take Monty Day in the first game of his Grand Finals. But it looks like Monty just lining this shot. He's going to take it. It's going to be 105. But that 110 nice was a nice morale boost to ease himself into that third game. Complete night and day difference compared to the first one we witnessed. Exactly. So, it's okay. This is a best of three after all. Both players are now neck and neck. They're gonna have to find out exactly what would be the tactic to play into this game. And I think that d -chan is probably putting quite a lot of the hopes in getting that two kilometers win. Because so far, one kilometers Three kilometers, that hasn't exactly been working very well for him. While the two kilometers wind is where things are starting to shake off. And I think that Monty Day should look out for that as well. Once he realizes that it is a two kilometers wind, I think that his general game strategy should change a little bit to, you know, adhere to uh, D-Chan's exceptional marksmanship.
Two he's kilometers! Been showing off that a little bit, yeah. Two kilometers again. In terms of resistance, as Monty will be taking his first shot. So, a fantastic way to respond, making that first game look like nothing. But you saw D Chan, how far he had to take Monty to take that first game here. Wait. Monty is going to go with 105, which is not too bad. Not the safest number, but you know what? It will take that considering it was a lot worse. It's both these players, their lineups have been a little bit on the struggle bus with this slight high amount of resistance. d is actually going to try and take over. Oh. It hits 105 of his own, which means because it's only equal, he will not be able to take over that target as we switch over back to Monty. A little bit different kind of game plan coming in from d -chan. Decided to go for a shot while the rotation is going on a diagonal axis instead right. of the regular horizontal axis. So. This is definitely a tough game for Dijan right now. Is a 105, to, uh, is a 105 take in the center of the board, or he tries to block off at the bottom left hand side, which I don't think makes sense. 105 is probably the only one that he want to go for. He should take his time. He should have taken his time and wait for the perfect cue. But unfortunately, another one, another game, right? We've seen night, we've seen day, and what is this? Midnight. Nah, just day again. Just day again. <laughs> <laughs> 104 comes out for Monty on the bottom left hand side. Currently up 2 1 in this best of five grand final. As D Chan realizes that he was on the pedestal at the beginning, but now complete opposite end of the spectrum here. But Monty, though, one game away for being the Olympic Esports Series oh. champion. It's, it just hit me that we are now on match point. Yeah, it just hit me. It happened so fast. It happened so fast. The first round took a long, long time, and that is what I was expecting. Every single round to take that amount of time. But without further ado, we're not even going to let you guys wait as we move on to the third, oh, sorry, the fourth game between Monty Day and d -chan. With Monty Day on to match point. One more game. And one more win, and he will be crowned Great. the first place winner for the 2023 Olympic Esports Series Tic Tac Bow. Great stuff there from D-Chan, 107 bang in the center, two kilometers again as a resistance as Monty's been abusing the fact that he's just getting such great scores Great. with this resistance, 108 on the top right. D-Chan knows what has to be done here is and now going to rethink his decisions to decide what path he wants to take. He is the one dictating the pace here and the tempo. And of course, Monty has to play the blocking game until any kind of low Great. score arises. But Close. it's just not happening. D-Chan with 108 of his own in the top middle. None of these boards are readily... Can, can pretty much be taken over just yet. Monty Day is holding his own very well with a first 108 shot. And I think that he's going to get a pretty Great. darn good shot here as well. Or Ooh. perhaps not. Okay. 102 Ooh. in the bottom middle. So if I was the Chan, I would take that all day, considering how consistent he's been so far the last couple of shots. The last game, maybe not. But this time around, 102. Massive window, especially at this high level play in the grand finals. He oh, does manage to hit it. 107 once again coming up from D-Chan. We've got ourselves a game five in this best of five. So in this next game, whoever wins this is going to win gold here at the Olympic Esports Series for archery. So honestly, this is what we want. This is the kind of game that oh, we yeah. want to see. Best of five go all the way to the five. And both players, let's be honest here, they are ready to shadow. Uh, they are ready to shatter with any wrong move. And this is very much what we would want to see from Tic Tac Bell. One wrong move. And it's all over. Yeah, with Tic Tac Bow, normally one mistake will cost you the game, but one mistake here could cost them gold medal here at the Olympic Esports Series. And for D Chan, he's probably feeling a lot more relieved considering he just had to fail upon two very quick but very efficient games here by Monty. And now, game five here in this best of five grand final. And it's going to be Monty. Going first here. Two kilometers again. This resistance has been pretty brutal for the last few games here. Is now Monty going to line up his shot? He knows it will have that slight advantage here going into the center. Good stuff from him. 108. That's a great way to start off this final game. I think the pressure is rising for D Chan. 
We have been looking at two kilometers for the past three games, and he have yet to get that 110 that we have been looking out for. A little bit, I, 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 I'm, I'm not too sure if whether this is a impatience coming in from D Chan because he's been gunning for these diagonal shots, and so far I haven't seen him done very well with these diagonal shots. Oh, that was brutal. 101 coming up from D-Chan. A huge window of opportunity now for Monty to take that over and push the distance to 70 meter targets. And D-Chan got a little bit sloppy there on his first shot in this last game. Will we see it again? We're not too sure. The nerves and the pressure getting the best of him here. 106 coming up from Monty. He knows that bottom left target is going to be the big one. But for D-Chan, what scoring is he going to hit? Great. A 1-6 as well. Monty Day now have a choice to continue to set up double opportunity and the trap over to D-Chan or to just take the 106 over for himself. If he goes for the middle right or bottom right, that means that he's going to force D-Chan to have to take over one of those targets. If he gets at least another 106, then that's going to be huge for him. Oh! He actually only hits a 58. That is big for D-Chan. He could have won that just from that target. If he hit at least a 106 at that middle right, we could be seeing a entirely different story in this process. But this final game in the grand finals has just been brutal for both players. Pressure is definitely starting to flare up here. Take your time, Dijan. Take your time. The rotation that you're looking for is here. But he's letting that skip over. There's not a lot of window for him to play around with that. So he decided to go for the horizontal take. Or perhaps not. That's a oh. good shot. That's an amazing shot. That's what you want to see. Unbelievable. So now he's almost back into the driving seat. Is Monty now just looking back at his lineups, planning his next course of action as we're just at the halfway point in this final game. But what a momentum killer here towards Monty's way here. With that 80 meters does get 104, which to be fair, isn't too bad with the resistance he has to deal with and the 80 meter targets. But it does mean once again, D-Chan is gonna go for the block. But I think the oh. pressure's here. He had to go for the top middle, but instead, Monty, all he needs to do now is go for that bottom middle target. Doesn't matter what scoring he'll get, and he'll be able to take this grand final. Now, it all rests on Monty Day to take over this 96. And as he draws his bow, he takes the shot, and he ends the game! And he ends the entirety of the Olympic Esports Series 2023 Tic Tac Bow with a perfect bullseye! Congratulations to Monty Day. Incredible stuff here. Your new Olympic eSports Series champion. Finishing it with a score of 110 on the final target. Literally to perfection. He was one of the favorites coming here. And now he's won the entirety of this tournament. Congratulations to him. I'm ex absolutely excited to see and hear what does Monty Day have got to say about this. So let us pass the microphone over to Chad and hear out from Monty Day. I am here with our winner. Congratulations, so much pressure going into that last first place match and to be the first Olympic esports winner from the USA. Talk us through the emotions. Oh man, there was a lot going on in the final there. I kind of had a brain fart, but you know, we got through it. Um, it was just, it was a tough mental battle and David played really well too, but it was, I'm just so happy. <laughs> How about D-Chain pushed you all the way as well? He's a great player. Yeah, he didn't think he was going to make it this far. He undersold his own skills, but he's really good, and he made it all the way here, and he gave me a run for my money, so he did really well. Hey, well done, man. Congratulations. Have a look at this. A big crowd here in Singapore. You are the man. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Well, game has been done from the Tic Tac Bow side. I am extremely, extremely excited to see how the podium is going to be like and how the players are going to be working things around. But with that all said and done, this is where we are coming into a close very soon as 
we are probably gonna, uh, not probably, but we are definitely gonna be giving away the, these trophies. Oh, absolutely, yeah. We've seen some incredible games all day long. Make sure you give it up for all these players as well, going through the entirety of his qualif sorry, qualification process uh -huh. over the last few months. And they've been looking phenomenal. They put on a stellar show here Indeed. in the Olympic Esports Series. Now, my turn to throw the question over to you. What's the play that really stood out to you? Do you know what? The, you know, not to be biased in any way, but that very last shot was the most interesting because he could have gone bottom middle and just end it with any score, but instead he took over d Chan's 96. It's kind of like sort into the wound, really. We feel 110 at that. Yeah, but the thing is, though, he already had a 96 in the top left, but he just had to go for bottom middle. It was open. Like, the target hadn't been overtaken, so he could have just got, like, a 10 if he wanted. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're done. Let us throw over to the trophy ceremony. Let's welcome our top three finalists. In third place, give it up for Kyosuke Takebayashi. In second place, Davy Chen. And the winner of archery at the Olympic Esports Series 2023, Jared Montgomery. We'd like to invite Jared to lift the trophy. Let's do it in three, two, one. Give it up for your winner of archery at the Olympic Esports Series 2023. And that is all from us. Myself, Abstract, as well as Lethal. We are glad and happy to be your commentators. Any last words from you, Lethal? Fantastic competition. Couldn't ask for more here. And it's some stellar stuff from all these players. And that is all from us, as well as from Claudio. We are going to be passing the microphone over to Stage 1. Have a nice day. Welcome along wherever you are watching us in the world. What a first day it has been so far at the inaugural Olympic Esports Week Singapore 2023. And it's about to get even better because the Rocket League show match is fast approaching. My name is Edward Russell. Alongside me at the caster's desk, Callum Keir and John McDonald. Callum, how exciting is this? It's been fantastic, hasn't it? I've only been here a day. The people around here have been so, so lovely. Now can't wait to showcase some Rocket League. Yeah, it's all about Rocket League, John. Just give us a bit of an idea for those who don't know. What is Rocket League? It's very simple. I mean, uh, it, you're kind of fusing something we're all familiar with. That's, you know, car sports and then football or soccer, depending on where in the world you're from. Put those two together, add in a little bit of flying car action, and that's that's pr pretty much it. You don't need to uh, really have a deep knowledge of the game to understand the core fundamentals, um, but it's a very difficult game to play. That's pretty much it. John made it sound so simple. Callum, this game has been around for a while. You were telling me before we came on air that you used to play the previous version of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it used to be called, and I'm going to try and get this one right first time. Supersonic Acrobatic Rock Power Battle Cards. Hey, I'm